the jet around seven. Where are you going? New York. Is there anything I can help you with? I don't think so. Okay, who's up first? You're seeing Spencer and his attorney at two o'clock, then Kathy Grant and her attorney. I hope we can avoid any more losses. It's a public relations nightmare. Yeah, I just hope I can get some of my money back from that one. Well, leave him alone. Brown! Hey, Brown! Up here! Take it easy on him, okay? As if he were my own son. Wanna bet he doesn't make it up the stairs? You're lazy, Brown. Your days are numbered, kid. Yes, sir. How you doing, Brown? Feeling okay? Never better. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear it. A couple of these expansion teams have been calling about you. you. Got some crazy idea that I might want to trade you just because you blew a few games for us. Hey, anybody can have a slump. Excuse me, I, I'm sorry. Uh, what'd you say? I said anybody can have a slump. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. And I told him, just watch how well he's going to play for the rest of the season. So if you hear any rumors about being traded, don't believe it. You're part of the family. Very subtle. Yeah, like you, I suppose, huh? Well, let me tell you something, kiddo. It's about time you learn how to handle people, okay? That's subtle enough for you? You know, Spencer could become a real problem unless we can come up with a settlement. Why are you so worried about this hockey player? He's probably one of the most popular stars we ever had, that's all. Eh, all fans think that professional athletes are greedy and overpaid, but they also have a short memory. Well, Spencer doesn't. He remembers all the promises you made. He's got nothing on paper. All he's got is a bad temper. No, I was with you when you told Spencer you'd take care of him. Now, that's very interesting. Read my lips, because I'm only going to say it once. I was alone. Get it? Kathy! Ha <laughs> oh, you're looking wonderful. How are you? Thatcher, this is my attorney, Wendell Parker. Mr. Horton. Any objections if I um, have a private moment with your client? None, if she doesn't. What the hell do you think you're doing? Just asking for what's coming to me. Oh, why didn't you come to me? Why drag a lawyer in? What's the matter? Don't you trust me? Absolutely not. I see. Well, my dear, if my memory serves me correctly, I think it was you who deceived me. That's low, Thatcher. Yes, but is it low enough? You gotta promise me. I promise. I won't take his arm off at the socket. I won't even break his nose. You sure you want me to do this? Yes, I'm sure. Bobby, I don't negotiate contracts. It's not what I do. I should have some high-powered attorney for this. Look, I've been through these guys before. They took me for every penny, and it didn't turn out any better. You I trust. Okay, then. Here's the deal. The only way I can negotiate with Horton is to make him think that I can roast him in front of a jury. But if he thinks even for a second that his attorney can make you nuts... Looking at Mr. Sub-Zero. Today is not just practice. So be prepared. I'll do everything to provoke you. I know a little about delivering under pressure. Two playoffs in the championship finals. I remember. Yeah, you do. It's just the entire sports world has forgotten. I bet he knows how I feel. A couple of more off games, Horton will trade him. Fame. How fast it all goes away. Come on, let's show him you still got it. Bobby! How's it going? Kathy, yeah, things are great. How are you? Ooh, terrific. <clears throat> Well, I almost as well as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, this is Ken Malansky, my lawyer. Kathy Grant, tennis superstar. Hey, I'm a fan. Never forget that time you beat Martina on that tiebreaker in Paris. Neither will I. <laughs> well, we're due upstairs. Okay. Give him hell. Hey, you too. Now, Mr. Horton, let me go over a few things about depositions so we won't have any misunderstandings. Young man, I have been deposed more times than you're likely to do the job in your entire career. Uh, I know I'm under oath, so why don't you just go at me best you can. Give it both barrels, okay? Right. 
Mr. Horton, are you the owner of a hockey team known as... Let me help you out here. Look, I own this arena and the teams that go with it. Um, I employed your client as a player on my hockey team, and one year he even started. Turning your attention to the playing season a few uh, I'm years sorry, ago. Excuse me just a minute. Thank you, dear. Sorry about this. <laughs> Doctor's orders. Oh. Okay, now, um, where were we? Was that the year that my client not only started, but was team captain? Two seasons ago, uh, yes, he was. And did he injure his right knee in the last game of the regular season before the playoffs? Yes, he did. <clears throat> Terrible thing. And did the doctor tell you he ran the risk of permanent injury if he played again before having surgery on the knee? Well, now, I believe there were several medical opinions. That could have been one of them. Lord knows I paid enough doctor bills for your boy there. <laughs> Sir, just answer my questions. Sorry. Didn't you come to my client and ask him to lead the team in the playoffs? I did not. Didn't you tell him that the only chance the team had of winning the Stanley Cup was if he played? No, as a matter of fact, I had two players ready in his position who were just as good, some say even better. Now, don't give me that look, Bobby. You know as well as I do. You started the year hot as a pistol, but the last third, you kind of fell apart. Who are you going to replace me with, huh? Rogers? At my worst, I'll skate him off the ice. Isn't it a fact that you promised my client that if he played and was injured, you'd take care of him? It is not. Isn't it a fact that you promised him a job in management that would be equal to the balance of his contract? No way. Come on, counselor. My entire front office doesn't make as much as I was paying him. Isn't it a fact that you Son, even... the fact is, you're a boy here, and I mean no disrespect to somebody who has been a good player. The truth is... Your boy here has some big expenses. I mean, he got a little greedy. Women, fast cars, some say cocaine. Hey, that is a lie. Let's go off the record, please. I did not personally believe it, but like I said, he had a lot of expenses. Sure, he wanted to play. Hell, he needed money. Hey, what I wanted was a championship. Stop it, Bobby. Took a chance, and he lost. Too bad, I'm sorry, but that's the way it goes. Got in the fast lane, you couldn't handle it. You got greedy, kid. That's pathetic, but you're watch. Hey, you son of a Bobby! Get off! I'm fine! That's enough for today. We'll reschedule this deposition at a oh, time when... Counselor, this deposition is finished now. So is your client, so why don't you just leave, hmm? Stop it! Who the hell does he think he is? He is lying! That's enough! No, it is not enough! Not for him! I'll tear his head off! Maybe then he'll tell the truth! You were on your way to New York. What happened? Uh, we had a little equipment failure on the plane. They're working on it now. I'll just fly out again in the morning. So, uh, tonight I'm yours. Can I ask you something? Sure. You hear me when I came in just now? Mm-hmm. Could have been anybody. You seem pretty relaxed. 
You should know by now, but not much frightens me. Maybe you were expecting somebody? <laughs> Would you care? <laughs> I might. Darling, you know that I'm as true to you as you are to me. Yes, I'm sure you are. much better idea. Why don't you join me? I might just do that. You might just join me or you might just break my neck. Don't go away. I'll be right back. I need to leave a message, oh, please. Good morning, Mr. Malansky. May I assume you're down here looking for work? I'm Robert Spencer's attorney. What are you holding him on? I do believe you have your work cut out for you. Why? Thatcher Horton was found shot to death at his home last night. Horton? We found the gun in your client's car. And here the poor boy just can't seem to remember where he was. And there's another thing. Eric, would you be kind enough to pass me that lab report, please, sir? The lab confirms that gun was the same gun that was used to kill Thatcher Horton. We are now charging your client with the crime of murder. Would you give me a few minutes with my client, please? Ken, I didn't kill anyone. What happened? I don't remember. But the last thing I remember, I was in this bar. Don't ask me which one. I wake up this morning, the cops are pounding on my Did door. They have a I don't know. I mean, they're all over the place. And then one of them comes in and says he found a gun that had recently been fired. Was it your gun? I don't have a gun. What I have is a splitting headache. Can you get me out of here? Harry? Yes. You haven't touched your breakfast. I'm reading a brief. Your eggs will get cold. Oh, I finally have all the plans for the fishing trip. I thought the fishing trip was canceled. Judge Blaine and I have arranged everything. He and Mr. Higgins are going to meet in San Francisco day after tomorrow. And then you're all going to Vancouver. 
Two weeks of fishing with a judge who's never ruled for me and a lawyer who can only talk about his fees. Perry, you need a vacation. I've had a vacation. <laughs> Too late to change your mind. Mason. We go before the judge tomorrow morning. Now, if we can get you out on bail... Wait, wait, wait. Can... If? Ken, you got to get me out of here. It's not quite that simple, Mr. Spencer. Don't forget you've been charged with murder. Yeah, but I didn't do it. I'm innocent. Besides, I can't actually prove I did do it. What about the gun? Any idea how it got in your car? Look, I already told Ken I don't remember how I got home, even where I was. And your threat to violence against Mr. Horton. Listen, if they put away everybody who hated Horton, there wouldn't be enough jails to hold them. Hey, whose side are you on anyway? I'm looking at the prosecution's case. Motive, opportunity, murder weapon. I've seen men convicted on less. Yeah, well, then why are you wasting your time talking to me? Besides, I don't have the money to pay a big-time lawyer. I'm not your lawyer. I'm only here as a favor to Ken. Oh, this is a favor? You come down here and tell me I'm definitely going to prison? Hey, idiot. Man, you obviously don't believe me. I mean, you think I'm a liar, maybe even a killer. Man, why don't you take a walk? Good idea. Brilliant. What? What? You're really worried about Bobby's chances, aren't you? The evidence against him is substantial. He has you. I felt better about that, too. Oh, Ken, he can't be in better hands. Uh, I don't know, Amy. Besides, you have me. And I'm not referring to the fact that we've now been engaged five months, three weeks, and two days. I meant that professionally. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I'm sure you've noticed that it's been weeks. Well, months, actually, since I've asked to be involved in your work. I have noticed and been grateful. But why do I think that's about to end? Before you develop an unfortunate attitude, well, there are a few things I think you should be aware of. Like what? Well, like for the past few months, I've been enrolled in the university's police science program. You what? Investigative techniques, criminalistics, procedures... I think I'm really ready to help you, uh, Ken. Amy. Ken, I don't want to be a dilettante all my life. I want to do something constructive. And I've been working really hard to prepare myself so that we can be a team. I was hoping that you'd be pleased. <laughs> I am pleased. And proud and impressed. But this is a murder trial. So? So I'm not sure that I'm even up to it. Much no. less me. Well... Ken, you really don't have any confidence in me, do you? I, I never said that. You don't have to. Amy, try to understand. Oh, I understand. You're worried about this case. And since it's a serious case, you don't want me underfoot. That's not what I'm worried about. Oh, well, what are you worried about? I was wrong to represent Bobby Spencer at the deposition. And a murder trial is worse. It's out of the question. I'm too close to this guy. <sighs> Can you go back to Perry? I doubt it. Well, if you change your mind, he's giving another lecture at the police science department tomorrow. I know, because I'm going. Good night. Amy, the door's locked. There, you see? With your keen deductive powers, you certainly don't need me. I'm really sorry about that. Bob's not really like that. Dan, just... you've got some real problems right. with your case. The main one is your client. I know, and I know I'm asking a lot. Ken. I need more than advice. I need you on the case. Everybody has the first murder trial. This case needs you, not someone first time out. Now, before you make any snap judgments about Bob, let me just tell you this. He and I practically grew up together. 
He's from a very poor family, and his father deserted him when he was 10, and he's been supporting the bunch of them ever since. When he lost his income from hockey, it wasn't just him that was hurt. It was seven other people who depend on him for their livelihood. Robert Spencer is innocent. He couldn't commit this crime. How much of that would have been your opening remarks in the civil suit? Well, I... First part. Very effective. Especially the part about the seven people. However, I'd specify who they were, give them names so the jury sees them as real people, not just numbers. On the whole, not bad. When we were in law school, you told us never to get personally involved with our clients. Well, I can't help it. I'm too close to this. He's my friend. I know he made a lousy impression on you, and I haven't got a right to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Please take the case. If you can't do it for him, then do it out of friendship for me. You want me to break my own rule? Take the case for a friend? Well, let me tell you. When we get to court, if there's a summation, it's all yours. Judge, $250,000 bail. How'd you swing the money, by the way? I didn't. Mr. Mason did. Oh. Uh, about the bail, thank you. Listen, uh, I may have been a little rough on you yesterday. I just want you to know that it wasn't personal. Neither is what I'm going to tell you. I got you out on bail because Ken asked me to. I also like having my clients looking healthy and fit and confident when they walk into court. So I booked you into a room here. I don't want you to leave this hotel. There's a great health club downstairs, and I hope you use it. Under no circumstances are you to have alcohol, visitors, or talk to the press. Is that clear? Well, maybe I should just go back to jail. Maybe you should. Any questions? Yeah. Who's paying your fee? No fee. Every decade or so, I take on a client like you just for the hell of it. There's his key. All right. Who would you pick to a friend, Spencer? Probably someone who saw him threaten Horton earlier in the day. And who might that be? People in the waiting room. Kathy Grant. The tennis star? Horton's son, Stuart, and somebody else, Temple Brown. The basketball player. You really think one of them could have been the murderer? Well, it's certainly possible. But which of them had a motive? All right, I'm going to check around inside, and you... And I'll check around outside. Well, Mrs. Horton... Outside of a bit of black, very few mortals would realize the depth of your grief. Coffee? No, thank you. You know, if I were to tell you that my husband and I had a marriage based on love, you'd know that I was lying. Thatcher and I, however, were friendly if not true friends. How's that for honesty? Refreshing, as far as it goes. I hope that means I'm a suspect. I have always wanted to be considered capable of murder. As long as I was innocent, of course. I'll be sure to make a note of that. Now, just before you married your late husband, there were great rumors about a prenuptial agreement. I'm sure you'll find out they were more than just rumors. I remember them so well. The agreement provided that I get half a million dollars a year for three years if my husband divorced me. 
nothing if I divorced him. And they say they repealed the Fugitive Slave Act. They also say he had a new girlfriend. <laughs> he always had a new girlfriend. This one was supposed to be serious. Relatively speaking, Thatcher strayed. He was not stolen. Now, if there's nothing else... No, no. Nothing at the moment. However, I'm sure we'll meet again. Amy. Of course. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? What, what are you doing here? Is it obvious? Working. And thank goodness I already photographed where the killer landed before you completely Working decimated... on my case? Oh, is this your case? When I was hired as Della's assistant, all I knew was that some young green lawyer was going to help me. Amy, you went to Perry Mason behind my back. To be more precise, I went to Della Street and proposed an entry-level position for myself. You know I exactly I what I mean. Amy, you finished? Quite. Well, oh, I see you've met Della's new assistant. Yeah. Let's uh, take a look at all of this. Ken, would you go to where the killer was? You can stay on this side of the wall. Now, I'm in the spot the police marked as the place Horton was standing when he was shot. Ken, how far apart are we? About 20 feet. At least 20 yards. All's forgiven. You can come back now. Horton had just gotten himself a drink. He was probably moving around. Like that? He was shot three times. In a pattern no larger than two inches. By a killer 20 yards away. Shooting through curtains. The killer was a hired gun. Yeah, the average person about to commit a crime of passion would have their heart pounding, their hands shaky, and they... Well, according to everything I've read, anyway. Expertly planned and executed. Only a professional could have done it. Any of our suspects could have hired the killer. Even if they had an alibi at the time of the murder, they could still be guilty. Top marks to both of you. As long as that first row of seats is 30 feet from the baseline, it should be okay. Let's go look. Oh, again? Kevin Holansky. Sure, Bobby's attorney. Could I talk to you for a few minutes? Of course. I'll meet you downstairs, okay? You know, I don't think for a second that Bobby did it. I'll tell you anything I can to help him out. Thank you. Uh, how well do you know Thatcher Horton? We were in a business deal together, organizing a women's celebrity pro tennis tour. Huh. Whatever happened to that, I remember reading all the advanced publicity and then suddenly it was canceled. Well, he said he couldn't do it. But you quit the pro circuit in order to go into business with him. I felt I was beginning to burn out. It seemed like a good opportunity. Your contract with Mr. Horton required that you render exclusive services in exchange for very little money. You were giving up the possibility of millions on the pro tour. I would have been part owner and I would have made it up on the back end. Look, I thought you wanted me to help you with Bobby. Why these questions? It's my job to see who might have had reason to kill Thatcher Horton. How I may have felt about Thatcher Horton wouldn't have made any difference. I was busy taping a late night talk show when he was shot. About uh, 300 people saw me. Satisfied? It's possible that the killer was a hired gun. What's that got to do with me? Didn't you threaten him with a lawsuit over the collapse of your business partnership? He was going to settle with me. What made you think he'd treat you any differently than anybody else? He would have settled with me. Excuse me. I'm looking for Stuart Horton. I haven't seen anybody. 
I just work on plants. Well, that's certainly a healthy bromeliad. What's your secret? No secret. I change the soil. That's interesting. This particular orchid doesn't grow in soil. Oh, really? Well, I'll keep that in mind. Yes. Keep that in mind. Mr. Mason. Yes? Mr. Horton's running a little late. I'll wait. Pain, frustration, and disappointment. It's not religion or politics, it's money. Take a look at this. Too bad we can't cash in. Offering $50,000 for information about who shot Thatcher Horton. I thought they caught the guy who did it. Maybe they caught the wrong guy. You know anyone selling hot guns? Charlie, you're not doing a little business on the side, are you? <laughs> I got a workout. I don't want to talk about it no more. Looks like a moment to divide and conquer. You take Temple Brown. Right. Only authorized personnel in here. I'm Robert Spencer's attorney. Yeah? So? So I talked to the bartender at one of the clubs Spencer visited the night of the murder. He says you were there and that you bought my client a drink. Yeah, so you say. Look, we can do this one of two ways. You can talk to me now or in court. I don't much care which. Your choice. My choice, huh? Well, my choice is to get on with my workout. If you want to talk, you keep up. Sorry about your father. If you don't mind, I have a few questions. Well, of course. Were you and he very close? Well, my mother died when I was 15, and after that, all my father and I had was each other. Thanks, Danny. But he sent you away to school. Yes, that's right, military boarding school. Which was very good for me. Taught me discipline for the first time, then college. But we spent every summer and all my vacations together. <laughs> Sounds like a great life. Mr. Mason, my father was a difficult man. It wasn't easy being his son. How about being his employee? Worse. No longer a problem, is it? All his wealth, position, and power are yours now. Eventually, it would have been mine anyway. He was grooming me to take over paint a very different picture than the one I've gotten. I was told your father paid you no more than a secretary, gave you no authority. And from his memos, I gathered he knew for certain you were afraid to leave your job or afraid to stay. Well, I know one thing for certain, Mr. Mason. I'm not afraid of you. Spencer's guilty. He's going to pay for it. I saw him at the club. I even bought him a drink. Feel sorry for the fool. The fool? Trusting Horton. Even if he says what he claims he did, the man's word wasn't worth spit. What time did you see my client that night? More or less. It's hard to say. I was with a lot of people. Last thing I wanted to talk about was that old man. Sounds like you didn't like Horton much. My father was a real hard dude, but smart. You almost had to respect him. What about the son? 
Saw you with him today. What was that all about? Son, stupid. Thinks the way to get me to play better is to threaten to trade me to an expansion team. I've been your best year. Well, cold in the clutch a couple of times. That happens to everybody. It's not what the sports writers are saying. They're really sticking it to you. Yeah. I'd like to see one of them put it in. 17,000 people screaming at you. 22 feet out, one second on the clock. <laughs> you played somewhere. High school, some in college. Yeah, you almost good. <laughs> These are plastered all over the arena. Oh, oh, the bailiff at court had one. I've been passing them out. I have six high school kids helping. $50,000 reward for information revealing seller or purchaser of Thatcher Horton murder gun. 357 Desert Eagle automatic. Serial numbers filed. Cracked handle and silencer. Straightforward, not too dramatic. Also, $100,000 for information leading to the identity of the true killer. An incentive program. I wanted to appeal to the truly greedy as well as the borderline weasel. It's incredible. Thank you. I don't think that's what Ken had in mind. Uh, honey, what you've done is... Extremely dangerous. You could be hurt. But it's so practical. Amy. A lot of people will read this. You even left your home phone number. Of course. I didn't want Della bothered with all those calls. I didn't leave my home address. Besides, who would hurt me? The killer. Oh. So, what are we going to do? Well, she'll have to stay close to you. I'm afraid you'll have to put aside whatever disagreements you have, at least for the moment. I'll stay close, but I'd rather not. I'll stay close to her. But I'd rather not either. So would you wait a minute, Amy? Charlie left here about an hour ago. Just ran out the door. Where? Not a clue. Except that she was real excited. Like winning the lottery or something. Money. Lots of money. Like falling from the sky. I mean, one minute she was reading that flyer, the next minute she was gone. You know, she must know something about that Thatcher Horton murder. Hey, if Charlie gets that cash, you tell him that Al's entitled to a half of it. <laughs> I was the one who gave her the flyer. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Spencer, Dulles Street. We've spoken on the phone. I can't get so much as a beer in this hotel. I told you, no alcohol. I don't like being treated like a child. If, when this is over, you are a free man, you can have a thousand drinks of anything you like. Until then, try iced tea. I just got your message, dear. Yeah, I was looking for Ken. Do you know where he is? He was supposed to be with you. Oh, no, no, I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Listen, um, if he comes back to the hotel, will you tell him I got a message on my answering machine? Some woman named Charlie wants to meet at 5.30. She says she sold this killer the gun. Someone's at the door. I gotta go. Bye.
Sorry. Nice watch. Listen, what I'm interested in is a 357 Desert Eagle with filed off serial numbers and a cracked handle. Sold one like that last week. How about letting me in? Uh, no, we can talk here. Uh, can you tell me about it? People don't give their names. Well, can you describe them? Not really. Look, what I expected was the name or at least a description of the buyer. That's why there's a reward. Listen, why don't we go out for a drink, some dinner? Maybe my memory will come back. I don't think so. I have plans with my fiance. All right. Gun. She's late. She said 5.30. You're sure this is the right place? Yes. I think so. Who's that? Charlie? Are you Amy? We were worried you wouldn't show. Young lady, we need to talk to you. Yeah, and I need you like I need a funeral. Charlie, a man's life could depend upon your testimony. We really, yeah, well, my life depends on getting out of town. You blew it. I'm out of here. Well, we did blow it. Five minutes to make coffee. Oh, thanks. Just one cup. You don't have to feel compromised. I won't seduce you. Look, I really can't stay. Ken? Someone took the tape from my answering machine. That's how the man knew about the meeting with Charlie. Who was in the house? No one. I didn't let anyone in. Amy, that means somebody broke in. Oh, God. The man who came to see me today. Maybe he's the killer. And I let him get away. Oh, Ken. I made such a mess of this. I'm a failure as a detective. No, you're not. Yes, I am. Come here. Look, we, we wouldn't have gotten this close without you. And don't forget, you can identify him if we see him again. That could be very important. You think so? Absolutely. so easy for you to tell me that this is a perfect example of why I shouldn't be involved in this at all. But, yeah, well, but you didn't. You stood by me when I needed you. Ken. You've given me the strength to go on. I have? Definitely. All I need is 
was a good night's rest, and, well, tomorrow's another day. You don't learn, do you? What do you mean? Well, what I mean is you almost got the three of us killed today, and you're ready to start up again tomorrow, so nothing happened. I think I liked you better when I was weak and vulnerable. Well, I don't think we should discuss this tonight. Yes, if I were you, I'd leave while I was ahead. Come on. What are you doing? You're not staying here. A man broke into this house. It's not safe. You're staying with me. Now, come on. Well, when you put it like that, what can I say? I thought you said you wouldn't seduce me. I have to pick up some of Dad's papers from his study. see you every day but i just couldn't take the chance for your sake for my sake sweetheart i don't blame you but if people found wait out wait a minute about... wait a minute you think that i killed him honey i can't blame you i should hope not i assume that you did it me oh oh my look at your face i can't believe how well you lie i'm gonna have to reconsider a couple of things you have told me with so much conviction I hope I'm not interrupting family business. Actually, we were just talking about the murder. Anything new on the investigation? Yes, that's uh, why I'm here. More questions, Mr. Horton. I'll be in my father's office if you need me. All right, ask away. I just hope this theory is a little more interesting than your last theory. I think it will hold your interest. The phone call to your stepson on the night of the murder. Phone call? The records from the phone company say it took place almost at the time of the shooting. We know that because the call to the police was less than two minutes later. Is this leading somewhere? Yes. You're telling me who placed the call? Well, let me see. I was in the bathtub when the shooting happened. So apparently my husband called his son. I would guess to tell him that he wasn't going to New York after all. Wouldn't you think? The operator at your stepson's answering service remembers hearing a woman's voice. Mr. Mason, don't you know anything? An answering service has two real functions. One is to put you on hold, and the other is to write down your message incorrectly. Will there be anything else? I wouldn't be at all surprised. You look very comfortable in your father's chair. I am. What can I do for you, Mr. Mason? I was wondering why your stepmother called you the night of the murder. Well, you already asked Linda that question, didn't you? Now I'm asking you. Why? To see if we say the same thing? That's part of it. Well, why would you care what Linda and I discussed? I want to know who hired the killer that murdered your father, that's all. I'd suggest you and Linda get your story straight before the trial. The band was silver with these big chunks of turquoise on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know the one you mean. It had one with either a man or a woman's watch set into it. Have you sold many of them? Four, five. Four or five in the last couple of months. By any chance did you sell one to a man about 35, receding hairline, long sideburns, and really piercing blue eyes, about mm, this tall? Blue eyes. 
Yes, you know, I think I do remember saying one to someone like that. Why? Oh, he lost it in the bar where I work. He seemed like a good guy, and the watch looked like it cost a fortune. Mm -hmm. It did. <laughs> do you have it? No. No, my boss has it. And he won't return it until somebody claims it. Hmm? If you could just give me the guy's name. Oh, no, I don't think I should do that. <sighs> Miss, this is the fourth store I've tried. I'm tired, and I'm not going to argue with you. If you don't give me the name, as far as I'm concerned, my boss can just keep the okay, watch and... Okay, okay, okay. Let me see if I've got the credit card slip. What in the world? the killer, you won't need to go to court. You know where to find him? As a matter of fact, I do. Where is he? I'll show you. No, don't tell me where he is, and you'll wait here, understand? Absolutely. I mean, you're agreeing with me? I've learned my lesson. You think that makes any difference? You think the cops are really going to care about that? Terrific. times have we done this? Every time is like the first time for me. 
Well, hi, Della. Mr. Mason. Don't you look handsome. We're doing court in a half an hour. I doubt they'll start without us. There's something I want to say before we start. Just so it's not a confession. Well, it is sort of. Sort of an apology. I know I've been kind of a jerk. I'll sort of accept your apology. Look, I, I've, I've always had a temper. I, maybe, maybe that's why I was so good at hockey in the beginning. I was mean, sure it wasn't brains. I, hell, I'd never even gotten through college on my own. Ken pulled me through. He's a good friend. Probably better than I deserve. Look, the only thing I've ever been able to do really well is hockey. When I got hurt, and all of a sudden I lost that, I hated everybody, because I, uh, well, I felt like I didn't have anything left. That's, that's why I acted the way I did. I see. I mean, at first, I, I didn't even care whether I won or lost the case. No. Now I, well, I appreciate all you've done, all you're doing. Just wanted you to know that before we start. And I want to win. Well, let's do exactly that. Tell me, Lieutenant. After the arresting officers found People's Exhibit A under the seat in the defendant's car, what was done with it? I sent it up to the lab for a ballistics check. And what did you find? We found that we had a perfect match. That gun was positively identified as the one that was used to shoot and to kill Thatcher Horton. Thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions at this time, Your Honor. I do reserve the right to recall. Mr. Mason. Yes, Your Honor. I always have questions of Lieutenant Brock. Lieutenant Brock, how many times was the deceased shot? Three times, Mr. Mason. How close were the entry points of the bullets? Here's the coroner's report for your recollection. Uh, just a moment. Mr. Molansky, with the court's permission? Yes. Thank you. Mr. Molansky will be standing at the same distance Thatcher Horton was from the killer, assuming you to be the killer. Now, Lieutenant, I ask you once again, how close were the three entry points? The three shots came all within a diameter of two inches, Mr. Mason. About the size of a silver dollar. Quite a shot. You're a trained marksman, Lieutenant. Could you do that? Not on my best day, Mr. Mason. Shots would have to be almost simultaneous, wouldn't they? Otherwise, if the victim moved, turned, or fell, the target area would change. That is correct. Could you get off three rounds that quickly, Lieutenant? Probably not, but Mr. Mason, I'm not a professional athlete. I don't have the defendant's hands, I don't have his eyes, or I don't have his reflexes, sir. Very well, Lieutenant. You just mentioned the defendant's physical capabilities. Dr. McLeod, would you please stand? Dr. McLeod has been attending Robert Spencer for several years. He's prepared to testify that two years ago the defendant injured his right hand. It then became arthritic, leaving his trigger finger with limited mobility. Uh, thank you, Doctor. If that is true, how could Robert Spencer fire quickly enough to hit that target as it moved? Objection. Speculation. Your Honor, the lieutenant has investigated, what, dozens of shootings? Well, no, I say more, closer to 100, Mr. Mason. I suggest he more than qualifies as an expert. I'll allow it. Thank you. Now, Lieutenant, in your expert opinion, could a marksman with an arthritic condition 
and impaired mobility to his trigger finger have fired those three shots quickly enough to have hit that target as it moved? Probably not, Mr. Mason. Well, Lieutenant, if he couldn't hit the target, he couldn't kill the target. No further questions. Redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Lieutenant, is there any reason the accused couldn't have fired with his left hand? Objection calls for speculation. I'll allow it. Fair is fair, Mr. Mason. He could have, the defendant could have used his left hand. What about accuracy? Well, there again, at the distance in question, it would depend on how steady the hand, how good the eyes. Now, if a good athlete was motivated, he very easily could have done it. All hypothetically speaking, of course. No more questions, Your Honor. Mr. Mason, recross? Uh, no recross, Your Honor. You may step down, Lieutenant Brock. Ms. August? The people rest, Your Honor. Lieutenant. Nice dollar. Mr. Mason, is the defense prepared to call his first witness? Yes, Your Honor. Defense calls Kathy Grant. Miss Grant, would you please tell the court how well you knew the deceased? We were business associates. We were attempting to put together a women's tennis project. The project was scrapped, was it not? Yes, it was. We have information that Thatcher Horton was planning to get married again. Can you tell us to whom? How would I know? Because you were involved in his plans. Now, Thatcher Horton planned to get married again. So I ask you again, would you tell us to whom? All right, well, he did ask me to marry him, but I didn't take him seriously. But Mr. Horton was certainly a serious man, was he not? He spoke to his lawyers about divorcing his wife, did he not? Yes, well, he told me he did. He also mentioned naming me in a new will. A new will? Hmm. Then suddenly he broke things off. Then, within weeks, your business partnership with him collapsed. All that is true, is it not? No. No, that's not true. Isn't it true that you were personally and professionally betrayed by him? Isn't it true that when you demanded he compensate you, he refused? I learned the hard way what Thatcher was really like, but I didn't kill him. As a matter of fact, he didn't break it off with me. I told him I wouldn't marry him. Wouldn't marry him or couldn't marry him? Couldn't marry him. One of the wealthiest men in the country, the single most powerful man in sports. Now, what could you possibly say in the way of rejection? I had told him I was already married. I married a boy who was in the Air Force when I was 16. We didn't tell anyone because I was so young. He got his wings about the same time I turned pro. One day he was on a routine mission. There was an accident. He lost both of his legs. He told me I could go out and date. We could get a divorce. When Thatcher asked me to marry him, I thought about it, but I couldn't go through with it. I couldn't get a divorce. I knew it would kill him. I couldn't do that. I'm very sorry. No further questions. The witness is excused. This being the hour for our lunch recess, court will adjourn until one o'clock. State your name. 
the record, please? Linda Horton. Mrs. Horton, you are the widow of the deceased? I am. We were married for nearly five years. And would you describe your marriage as a happy one? I would describe it as successful. You just heard Kathy Grant testify that your husband asked her to marry him. How does that square with your definition of a successful marriage? I know nothing about that. You had no indication? None. No intuition? None. Absolutely. Mrs. Horton, I find it difficult to believe a bright, sensitive woman like yourself had no idea her husband was about to divorce her. Mr. Mason, my husband was notorious for his liaisons. In my experience, he took them to bed, not to the altar. Uh, Your Honor, may I have a moment? Yes, Mr. Mason. Now, you say you didn't know your husband was about to divorce you. But you do know about your husband's will. I have a copy of it right here. Just obtained from the clerk's office. I'd like to have it marked as defendants next in order. Without objection, so order. This document makes you equal with your husband's son, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Approximately, what would that share be worth? I couldn't say. Come now, in round numbers, in excess of $100 million? I suppose so. But if your husband left you, if not for Kathy Grant, then for another woman, your prenuptial agreement would provide you with $500,000 a year for three years, but you would inherit nothing. I suppose. Wouldn't you also suppose that you're much better off with your husband dead than alive? At least a hundred million dollars better off? Objection. Speculation, argumentative, and harassing the witness. I really would like to answer that, if you don't mind. The court will allow it. I had an intuition you might bring this up. So, I came prepared. This is a copy of the most recent will that my husband drew. His lawyer will file that for probate today. He gave me that several weeks ago. You'll notice that his son, Stuart, gets everything. I inherit nothing. For which you have my deepest condolences. I would imagine your grief would only be eased by another marriage. This one, perhaps to your stepson. Objection. Sustained. I have no more questions of this witness.
Hello? Amy, do you have any idea what time it is? Where the hell are you? What? He's in that room over there. How'd you find him? It was easy. How easy? Well, first of all, I assumed he was still in town since you'd heard him demanding a payoff. I didn't think he'd leave until he got it, which could take some time. So far, I'm with you. The only thing I knew for certain was that he wouldn't go back to the warehouse. So I deduced that since he was in hiding, he wouldn't have access to his own phone. So you decided to stake out every payphone in town? I staked out the phone he was using. That one. How'd you find it? Through the phone company. I thought he might be using a credit card. Turns out I was right. A motherly type at the local branch helped me out after I sort of explained to her that... There he is. Let's go, Sherlock. You say the sweetest things. Don't tell anybody. somebody to pick up the money Horton's son it's gotta be call the cops Getting any information from that one. 
Interesting that the hitman had a key to the arena itself, but not to the executive offices. Well, sir, that's probably because there are more arena keys floating around, in which case that would make them easier to steal. But when he gets inside, it's not to meet anyone. He wanted something from Stuart Horton's office. I wonder what he was after. That we will never know. Good night, all. I know people who would call that withholding evidence. He dropped it before he was shot. Why don't you tell the good lieutenant we'd like to study it for a couple of hours? Great. I'll order some coffee. Very hot. Very black. <laughs> you really think that this could be the answer? At this point, it had better be. Your Honor, I'd like to place this item in evidence as defense exhibit number seven. May I see it, Mr. Mason? Mr. Mason. Yes, Your Honor, I call Stuart Horton to the stand. Mr. Horton. You are the only child and sole heir of the deceased, are you not? I am, but I didn't know anything about that new will until yesterday when my stepmother took it from her purse. I see. You uh, worked for your father, did you not? I was vice president of his company. Large title, modest paycheck. Well, I was being trained to take over. But with that modest paycheck, you support a penthouse here in town? Yes. A ski house in Aspen? Beach house in California? That's true. Objection. Even for one of Mr. Mason's great fishing expeditions, we seem to be on a rather long line of irrelevancy here. Mr. Mason, I agree with the prosecution. I'm about to connect up, Your Honor. Quickly, Mr. Mason. How do you manage to live so well on so little, Mr. Horton? I inherited quite a lot of money from my mother. But you gambled that away, did you not? In fact, there was quite an unpleasant moment with your father over your betting on sports, was there not? He told me to stop, and I did. <clears throat> your Honor... I would like the clerk to show Mr. Horton defense exhibit number seven. Certainly, Miss Jackson. Now, Mr. Horton, would you examine that notebook, please, and tell me if you recognize it? I don't. You don't recognize it? No. Even if I told you the man who was shot last night in your sports arena, took it from the desk in your office? I've never seen it before. That brings me to my last order of business with you, Mr. Horton. I'm going to ask you about your relationship with your stepmother. Is it not true that you and your stepmother are lovers? Yes. I can't hear you. You're lovers. You hated your father, did you not? Yes. You hated him so much, you felt so humiliated by him, that you made love to his wife in his own house. Yes. I made love to her. Yes, I hated him. But I didn't kill him. I didn't kill him. I have no further questions. But I reserve the right to recall this witness, Your Honor. No questions, Your Honor. You may step down, Mr. Horton. Mr. Mason. I call Temple Brown. Mr. Brown. You're a member of Mr. Horton's basketball team, are you not? 
That's right. Two years ago, you were even voted onto the all-star team, weren't you? I was one of the top scorers in the league. One of the all-time greats. Now, would you please examine this notebook? Never seen it. Suppose I told you that the man who stole that book from Stuart Horton's desk was a hired killer. The same hired killer who shot and killed Thatcher Horton. I don't know. That's just a notebook with some scribbles in it. But very interesting scribbles. Would you please read the top line? Boston by at least four or fifty thousand dollars. Would you identify this bank statement for the record? It's mine. Marked as defendants next in order. Now, what is that deposit there? Fifty thousand dollars. Fifty thousand dollars. Made the day after your team lost to Boston. Suppose I told you I could match up at least 25 games last year with point spreads listed in this book and deposits in several of your accounts. I don't know. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. I am sorry. Sorry about you. You're a cheat. You threw games, shaved points, you broke faith with your teammates, you broke faith with your friends and loved ones, but most of all, with the fans who believed in you, all for money. You made plenty. You wanted more. Maybe. Maybe I did. But that's no reason to kill old man Horton. Exactly. No reason to kill Thatcher Horton. Every reason to kill his son, Stuart. That's crazy. Mr. Brown, what would happen to a professional basketball player found betting on games? Suspension. For how long? I don't know. Maybe a year, maybe life. If I don't miss my guess, Stuart Horton found out you were betting on basketball games. He threatened you with a suspension. He then got you to shave points. After that, there was just no turning back. Are you making this up as you go along? Objection. Speculation. Mr. Mason is fishing again. I tend to agree with the counselor. You do seem to be fishing, Mr. Mason. Uh, Your Honor, uh, counselor, uh, I'll tie this up in a minute. Very well, you may proceed, Mr. Mason. Objection overruled. Now, Mr. Brown, you hired that hitman to kill Stuart Horton, did you not? The killer shadowed him until he knew his habits, waiting for the right moment. Do you know what he found? I don't know anything. He found out every time the father left town. The son came over and slept with his wife. And that was the moment he picked for the kill. That's not true, none of it. The father came home unexpectedly, but the killer couldn't know that. All he could see through the curtains was the shadow. Your hired killer killed the wrong man. I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Brown, your hitman stole that notebook. That notebook and your bank statement ties you to him. It ties you to the murder. When you heard the wrong man was killed, you had to frame somebody fast. You'd heard my client threaten the father. You'd seen him that night on his way to being drunk. It couldn't have been too hard for you or Richards to follow him home and plant the murder weapon. That's just not so. Well... Here is something that is so. Your friend, Mr. Richards, died last night in a gun battle with the police. This morning he received... We 
received some startling news. Ballistics discovered that the bullet that killed him did not come from a police revolver. It came from this gun. This gun, which I would like to enter as defendants next in order. You recognize this gun, Mr. Brown? Lieutenant Brock and my associate, Mr. Molansky, found this gun in your locker. You killed Mr. Richards. After Richards shot the wrong man, he tried to blackmail you. So you followed him. You found him the same time as the police, and you made sure, you made very sure, that he was dead. You had one man killed. You killed another. And next, you had to kill Stuart Horton. Who were you going to kill after that, Mr. Brown? And for what? You think you're so smart. You know what it's like being booed? Thousands of fans yelling at you that you crap when you know you can make that shot? Sports writers just calling you names when you know in your heart you still got the stuff. Forced to lose when you know you're a winner. That's like. But I, I didn't mean for old man. I want a lawyer. Your Honor, I move all charges against my client be dismissed. The people concur, Your Honor. Defense motion granted. Lieutenant Brock, take this witness into custody for questioning. This court stands adjourned. Thank you. I've got a lot to be thankful for. Give me another chance. I won't waste it. I'm sure you won't. <laughs> You were wonderful, Mr. Mason. Congratulations. No, well, thank you. May we give you two a word of advice? Of sure. I believe there was a minor disagreement. That uh, was nothing. Amy, you feel Ken doesn't have any confidence in you. That's right. Ken. You feel as if Amy has invaded your area of capability and expertise. Uh, I wouldn't put it that way. I would. May we both point out that both of you, in your separate and individual ways, contributed to the solution of this case. You both were right. Take it from us. Never end a day where one of you is wrong. Today was a great day, and both of you were right. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. And thank you. <laughs>
you're late for your meeting. What is my schedule? You're due at the hospital in an hour, and Thomas Shea is cooling his heels in your office. No good. Let him. I don't think the most powerful attorney in the city likes to be kept waiting. Well, Mr. Shea tends to forget he works for us. Sister Margaret, you are becoming dangerously indispensable. I'm going to requisition you from the Archbishop. young nun is getting I still don't understand why you couldn't handle this by yourself. Well, Father O'Neill's asking some questions I couldn't answer. What kind of question? About our real estate dealings for the church. You handled most of the transactions yourself. Just who is this priest? They brought him in for an independent audit. He's, I hear he's already cleaned house in two dioceses. New accountants, new lawyers. Our firm has represented the church for over two decades. And I expect we'll be here long after he's gone. Ah. Father O'Neill, huh. I've heard so much about you. Nice to finally meet you, Mr. Shea. Mr. Bradley? Father, excuse me. I'm sorry to seem so elusive. I've been tied up on other matters. I see. Well, considering all the money we're paying, I'd have thought the church's affairs would come first. Hmm? Please. Good morning, Father. Well. How's it going with Father O'Neill? Are you keeping up with him? Well, right now I have to get over to the archives at the convent. And then I have to come back here to get some clarifications on the Archdiocese books before we leave for the hospital. And that's just this morning. Mm -hmm. You should be taking your final vows pretty soon. In two months. The church needs people like you. You keep us on our toes. Thank you, Father. Well, it's time to go. Someone has got to answer the Archbishop's phone. <laughs> Give my regards to the Archbishop. And remind him he owes me a dinner. I would like to review those partnership agreements on Monday. And so you will. Goodbye, Father. Thank you. Well, Monsignor, is the Archbishop in? He's off for the day with an old friend. Can I do anything for you? No. No, I don't think so. Father O'Neill. If you wish to discuss diocese business affairs, you talk to me. I talk to the Archbishop. The Archbishop asked me to report directly to him. Unfortunately, he is not available, and I am his financial director. I'm sorry. I'd rather wait till he gets back. Father, the hospital. Thank you. Excuse us. Well, we're early for a change. Maybe I'll make a few calls. Oh, no, no. I'm taking you to the cafeteria. You'll forget to eat lunch again. Have you become responsible for my care and feeding as well? Somebody has to be. You obviously can't do it for yourself. Sister, sister, anyone ever tell you you are impertinent? Lots of people. Father Come O'Neill. on. Yes. I understand you requisitioned some files from my office without my permission. Dr. Lattimore, I don't think this is the time or the place to discuss it. It's as good a time as any. Fine. Doctor, how you treat your patients, well, that's your business. But how you run this hospital, that's mine. Look, Father O'Neill, you want something from me. Just ask me. I did. Several times. Excuse us. Sister? What was that about? Uh, he's incorrigible. He's supposed to be a great doctor. And the worst chief of medicine any hospital ever had. He's autocratic, insulting. Because of him, all the best doctors are leaving. Well, it certainly wasn't very charming to you. Well, at least with me, he has an excuse. He knows I'm going to recommend he be removed. How was that? Marginal. Do you have those budgets the uh, hospital administrator sent over? Yes, I have them right here. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. <clears throat> mm. Oh, 
Hold, let me see that. Ooh. It's just a paper cut. I think it'll be okay. Does it hurt? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Father O'Neill, I uh, tried to reach you at your office. We left early. Is there a problem? Well, I couldn't get the accounts receivable you requested. Mrs. Cartwright, you're the administrator of this hospital. Can't you get me a simple piece of information? I'm sorry, but the computer went down. I'll have it in the next day or two. Well, no point in meeting until then. Good day. Get a blood pressure and a pulse. What happened? I, uh, we were taking a walk. I, um, uh, I sort of collapsed. The nurse will get your vital signs. I'll be right back. You can't stay here. I want to stay with my friend. Your Grace. Your what? Oh, John, haven't you met the Archbishop? Oh, great. I'll get the doctor. I don't believe it. Father O'Neill actually gave you time off. Father O'Neill is very dedicated. I don't know where you find the strength. They're teaching her patience. Mm, I call it endurance. It's like a marathon with Father O'Neill. She's young and aging fast. The man's a workaholic. I rather like it. Maybe you just like him. What's that supposed to mean? Oh, come on, Margaret. You can tell us. Tell you what? Tell us about you and Father O'Neill. I think you ought to mind your own business. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. No problem. Mr. Eastman, I've been going over the Archdiocese books. How long has your firm been our accountants? Oh, nine years. What's the occasion? None that I know of. Well, it's the best kind of gift, a surprise. Hmm. Very handsome. Would you excuse me? Have you seen Sister Margaret? Not this morning, Father. Look what she gave me. I must tell you, there has been some talk. Perhaps you two have been working too closely together. I've got to put a stop to this right now. Tom, don't be too hard on her. Father. Could you please explain this to me? I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Why did you give me this gift? I didn't give you a gift. There's a card. Oh, my love, Mark. I didn't write this. This isn't even my handwriting. Well, who wrote it then? Who else knows I always borrow your pen? Are you saying that I'm lying, Father? Do you have any idea who might have put this in my office? I don't know. I'm afraid people are getting the wrong idea about us. Maybe, maybe it would be simpler if we stopped. 
working together. We haven't done anything wrong. Margaret, what if someone is trying to discredit me? In my work with the church, I can't afford even the slightest hint of impropriety. Well, Father, we shouldn't let this change anything. It's not fair. Well, think about it. Oh, Mr. Eastman's been waiting long enough. Is there anything I can do? We'll talk later. I could ski down Mount Whitney. He never could catch up to me. That's what? true. But I could play gin. Gin. Oh. Ouch! Oh. How was your flight? Perry, I was worried to death about you. They told me you collapsed from exhaustion. I rushed here from the airport. I didn't even go to the hotel. I'm the one to blame, Della. You see, a few weeks ago, I brought in a priest, a troubleshooter, to look into the archdiocese's financial affairs. I haven't gotten the final report yet, but he's certain there's embezzlement in this hospital. Stephen asked me to help investigate. Several of his close advisors may be involved. Your secret would have been very safe with me. Sorry for the deception, Della. For the moment, I uh, want to stay undercover. <laughs> Very clever. You think so? Tomorrow we go to work. We'll begin by meeting with your father, O'Neill. Well, I must be going. Hey, when do I get the $16 you lost? When we finish the game. Not before. Good to see you again, Stefan. Mm. Stefan! The food here had better be good. Miracles do happen. About you. I've known that man 42 years. I've never seen him like this. It's that serious. Everything he's worked for is on the line. Hello? Of course, Father. One moment. Sister Margaret, it's for you. It's Father O'Neill. Yes, Father? Sister Margaret. I want you to come over to my hotel. Have you thought about what we discussed this afternoon? No, you'll never mind that. Just come over. Right away. You don't have to raise your voice to me, Father. I'll be there as soon as I can. Thank you. Margaret? Yes? Father O'Neill had to step out for a moment. I'm Richard Logan. Come in, please. Thank you, Father. He'll be back right away. Uh, would you care for something to drink? There's sherry. Don't I know you? No, I don't think so. Would you like some? Yes, thank you.
Are you in this diocese, Father? No, I'm at the Church of St. Virgil. I stop by the Archbishop's office when I'm in the city. And you're a friend of Father O'Neill's? No. Not really. I feel very well. Is something wrong? I feel I feel very dizzy. What what are you doing? Sister. Room service. Let me help you. I'm okay. I'm okay. Are you, you sure? Yes. Sit down. Thank you. Oh. Father O'Neill. Say this Father Logan gave you a glass of sherry. That's right. <laughs> Sister, we've been through this suite several times and no sign of your glass. In fact, we can't even find a bottle of sherry. Maybe he took it. I don't know. Let's get through. I ask you something else, Sister. Have you ever blacked out before? Do you have any sort of medical history? No. My sister Margaret. And how did you say you ripped your jacket? You tore it. Are you all right, my child? Um, Archbishop Carl, this is Sergeant Brock. Oh. Oh, can you tell me what happened? There really isn't much to tell. It appears Father O'Neill was stabbed sometime late last night. Do you have any idea who did it? Not yet. Is she free to go? Well, we really have a few more... Uh, Sergeant Brock, I think she's been through enough. Of course. Thank you. Archbishop, I'm looking for Father Richard Logan. Sister Margaret says he's at the Church of St. Virgil. Have you heard of the man? Give my office a call. You shouldn't be too hard to find. Thank you. Margaret is certainly going to be the prime suspect. I am concerned for her. You have good reason to be. Either she killed Father O'Neill or this Logan did, and I suspect the police aren't going to find him. Harry, 
press smells a scandal. I, uh, I'm embarrassed to ask. Then don't. You'd better see if you can get hold of Paul. And just what do you want me to tell him? Tell him to get here yesterday. I'd like to meet your sister, Margaret. I thought you'd never ask. Oh. Margaret! I'd like you to meet some old friends of mine, Perry Mason and Della Street. I heal quickly. Runs in the family. Father O'Neill was such a good man. Why would somebody murder him? I don't know. It's so unfair. You cared for him a great deal. Yes. We distributed a sketch of Father Logan all over the city this morning. And that includes parochial schools, churches, convents, rectories, every Catholic institution from here to the suburbs. And we showed it to all the guests and help at Father O'Neill's hotel. Sir, I'm listening. No one has recognized as Father Logan. No one has ever seen him before. And there's not one single shred of evidence to show that this Father Logan was ever in Father O'Neill's room. You think Sister Margaret is lying? I don't think that there is a Father Logan. Never was. And several witnesses have suggested that Sister Margaret was uh, close to Father O'Neill. And by that you mean... She had a romantic attachment to him, sir. That's absurd. I baptized the girl. I've known her since she was a child. Sergeant Brock, Margaret wouldn't lie, and she wouldn't break her vows. Archbishop... I'm going to have to conduct a search of her room at the convent, sir. By what authority? I have a warrant. I would have thought you'd have the courtesy to inform Sister Margaret. Thank you for your advice, Sister. We'll take it from here. I'll be in my office if you need me. Thank you, Sister. Had this one nailed. My dear Margaret. <laughs> the cab is downstairs. Good. We mustn't keep the Archbishop waiting. Sister Margaret, I'm afraid you'll have to come downtown with us. What's the problem? Who are you? The name's Mason. What do you want with Sister Margaret? We found Father O'Neill's letter in your room. What letter? I, ne I never got a letter from him. And who gave you the right to go through my room? We had a warrant, Sister. Why don't we step in here? Now, where is this letter? I have a copy of it here. May I see it? I'll read it to you. My dear Margaret, I fear we have been compromised and risk ruining our careers. He never sent me a letter like that. Let him finish. We'll both be better off if we put an end to it now and don't see each other again. I'm sorry you deserve better than to sign Tom. Mr. Mason, you have to believe me. How do you know that's from him? Oh, it's his, all right. We ran a handwriting comparison. 
That letter, it's about our working together, but he never gave that to me. Sister Marlowe, I don't think there is a Father Logan. He was there. And I swear to you, he was there. I don't think so. Why not? Because I think that she was in love with Father O'Neill. That is not true. We have this letter. You were seen holding hands. There was a lover's quarrel over a gift, and he ended your affair. There was never any affair. Sister Margaret, I think that you went up to his room, and I think you went up there to plead with him not to end it. I think maybe there was a moment between you two, and then you blacked out. But you blacked out after you killed him. That was not what happened. That's enough, Sergeant. Sir, we have her fingerprints on the knife that was used to kill Father O'Neill. Someone could have put the knife in her hand after she blacked out. Sister Margaret, I'm placing you under arrest for the murder of Father Thomas O'Neill. You have the right to remain I'll silent. I'll advise her of her rights. Are you her attorney, sir? I am now. Your Honor, defendant waives further reading of the complaint and advisement of constitutional rights. We enter a plea of not guilty. Your Honor, the state requests a preliminary hearing at the court's earliest possible convenience. Mr. Mason? Defense concurs. Thank you, gentlemen. This matter will be set for December 10 at 9 a.m. The court has recessed 15 minutes. All rise. Mr. Mason? Michael Rustin. Possibly you remember I appeared before you in appellate court. Yes. You made a very impressive argument. I'm flattered you remember. This uh, case, a delicate matter, especially for my client. Mr. Mason, you have a reputation for not cutting any deals. I'll see you on the 10th. How good is he? Very. Where's Paul? I'm meeting him at the airport at 11. Good. Bring him straight to Stefan's office. He's fine. We're going to meet him downtown. Well, wait a minute. Your messenger said he collapsed. He was in a hospital. Well, actually, he's just fine. You must be crazy. What am I doing here, Della? Well, there's a case, and... A case? You've heard of Stephanie Harris, the most beautiful model in the history of California? Her father was paying me to accompany her to Tahiti. Now Howard Burton is in paradise, and I am here on freezing. Will you please get in? What is this case? Well, there's a nun. A nun? Yes. I'll fill you in on the way. Get in. Terrific. Yes? Well, send them in. Hello. Hello. Archbishop Coro, Sister Margaret, I'd like for you to meet our private investigator, Paul Drake. How do you do? How do you do? Hello. Hello. Hi. Aren't you cold? I left in something of a hurry. You'd better get some warm clothes before you catch pneumonia. Good idea. You went over the case with Della. Oh, yes. I'd like you to start looking for Father Logan. Sister Margaret can give you what little information we have. The police haven't found any trace of him. Well, maybe we can. Is there any place I can get a cup of coffee around here? At the convent. Well, would you care to join me? I'm buying. Excuse me. Excuse us. This is the police are to sketch of Father Logan. Fairly accurate? Yes. Anything else? 
Scars, birthmarks? No. Mm -hmm. Anything peculiar that this kiss doesn't show? Like what? Did he uh, pull his ear, scratch his head, uh, have any habits or something strange? Anything about him that struck you was uh, kind of odd. No. No, I don't think so. No. No, I knew I had seen him before. It was in here. It was in the cafeteria, and he was... He was sitting right over there. And he was folding his matches. So? You asked if he'd done anything strange. He had a nervous habit. He lit a cigarette, and then he folded down all the matches in his matchbook. And I think he threw them away. He did that here? Yes. When? A few days ago. When do they collect the trash? This is what detective work is all about. Following the trail, finding the clues, and getting very dirty. You really like this kind of work? Well, it, uh, it could be worse. How? Let's thank the man upstairs. This is only a couple days worth of garbage here. Paul, I don't even know if Logan threw the matches away. And even if he did, they could come from anywhere. Tell you what, why don't you, why don't you pray for me, huh? Why don't you talk to me? What, uh... Sister Margaret? Something I said? With all due respect to my eminent colleague, I object to Mr. Mason representing Sister Margaret. Would you prefer local counsel? I don't think you understand the issues here, Mr. Mason. This is a scandal. And I, for one, don't want it to touch the Archbishop or the Church. Sir, Mr. Mason is your friend. As long as he represents Sister Margaret, you are personally associated with her defense. I agree completely. I made a commitment to Sister Margaret, and I intend to fulfill it. In any case, there's no avoiding the scandal. We are under no obligation to defend her. We can cut our losses. Just a minute. Why do you assume she's guilty? <laughs> the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming. But that's all it is. Circumstantial. Let's assume for a moment that Margaret is innocent. Why then does someone dress as a priest and kill Father O'Neill? Well, he could be, uh, you know, he could be a psychopath. Perhaps. Or it could have something to do with Father O'Neill's investigation of the church affairs. He was investigating us. I know. I'll need access to Father O'Neill's papers. The church's affairs are confidential. There is no other way to give Sister Margaret a proper defense, and I intend to do that, even if it requires a subpoena for every single one of you. That won't be necessary. A girl's life is at stake. We will cooperate in every way. Archbishop, we simply want to protect your reputation. I think it is in excellent hands. You need help. Now, what, uh... What's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? This is something that I always felt I must do. Yeah? You happy here? Mm-hmm. Sister Margaret, may I ask you something of a personal nature? Sure. Did you ever date when you were younger? A little. Did you miss it? I find great comfort in the church. Well, <clears throat> that's a shame. What do you mean by that? Well, oh, I, ju I just meant that uh, you're very pretty, I think quite bright, and I uh, would guess there's a lot of young men out there who would find you very appealing. That's all. Well, Mr. Drake, I'll take that as a compliment. 
please do. And while you're at it, take a look at this. What do you think? That's the way he folded them. You sure? I saw him do it in the cafeteria and at the hotel. Where are they from? The Westlake Health Club. Time for me to work out. Mr. Mason asked me to bring you this. Oh, thanks. Sorry. Perfect, eh? Any sign of Logan? Not yet. Margaret, you better go. Don't you want some company? I'm trying to be inconspicuous. Having you here doesn't help. I'm the one who can recognize him. I can do that from the picture. I think it would be a good idea if I stayed. Margaret, please. Look. Look, there he is. I want you to stay here. you to wait outside. This is no time to argue. Excuse me. A guy came in wearing a black jacket. Where is it? It's probably changing. Over there. Stay. Where are you going, sister? I'm with him. Come back here. Hey, hey, hey. What's going on here? You crazy? Hey, get here. Hey, get out. Somebody hired you, didn't they? Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's, uh, let's make a deal here, all right? Here, let me help you out. Sister Margaret, why don't you let me do my job? And you go back to the convent and you do your job, all right? And what's that? Pray that we haven't lost our father Logan for good. All right, how often did he come in here? Oh, I don't know, three, four times a week. Did you ever see him with anyone? Did he have any friends? Drake, I'm not keeping you away from anything, am I? No. How long has he been a member here? Six months. Six months. That means this man must have been a resident. Go away, Drake. What? Go away. Oh. All right, well, I'm going to be right over here if you need me. Please. Perry. The man we call Logan was registered here under the name of McGrath. Unfortunately... It appears that the name is a phony. So is the address. At least we know he exists. And knows we're looking for him. Well, you certainly were chasing someone that looked like this. This is the man who said he was Father Logan. Yeah, but I got nothing to tie him into the murder. You certainly can't arrest a man for running through a health club. Sergeant, I swear to you, he was in that room. Well, okay. I'm done here. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Well, we've got to place Logan at the scene of the crime. Go over the police file in the morning, double-check their interviews with everyone at the hotel. Consider it done. Another couple of washings. That sweater might fit. Sorry Logan got away. Yeah. 
Me too. What time are you picking me up in the morning? I didn't know I was. Don't you want me to go with you? I don't think so. You were right. I shouldn't have followed you into the health club. And I said I was sorry. Look, 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 sister, I don't want to get into this, all right? It's late. I'm wet. We're both tired. I'll keep you informed. Good night. I don't like your patronizing attitude. I am not being patronizing. You know I could be of some help. I can manage. And you're not very forgiving. And you are the most irritating nun I have ever met. As a matter of fact, you are the only irritating nun I have ever met. Maybe you could work on correcting that. Good night. There was a card. It was attached to the gift that Father O'Neill found on his desk. And I'm sure that he filed it away somewhere. Mm -hmm. It isn't worth getting upset over. Well, it wasn't my handwriting. And he, he thought that someone might be trying to discredit him. I don't know where it's going. Margaret. Margaret? It's not going to get any easier. <laughs> mm. Good morning. Good morning. We've been organizing some of Father O'Neill's papers. This is the hospital budget. And here are the preliminary reports on the real estate holdings. I'd like you to set up appointments with everyone Father O'Neill questioned. I wasn't present at all of his meetings. Well, whatever you can recall, give to Della. Where's Paul? Out solving this case single-handedly. He, uh, he went to buy some clothes, and then he was going to go see the police. Sister, see if you can find Monsignor Kaiser. I need to talk with him. Did something happen between Sister Margaret and Paul? I don't know. You worried about her? Yes. So am I. Hey, you know what? Mason's got me here until I satisfy him. The case is hopeless and he lets me go home. Come on, be a sport. Let me look at the case file so I can get out of here. I have 56 open cases to work on. I don't have time to be monkeying around with you. Let me put it another way. I could be gone inside of a week. That is the best off I have heard all day. A week. Thank you. Monsignor Kaiser, we were looking for you. Yeah, and here I am. Possibly you were searching for Father O'Neill's recommendation. Actually, I need the disbursement file. You mean this? Yes, thank you. Were you aware of Father O'Neill? was going to recommend that you be replaced? No, I didn't know that. It's no secret you weren't pleased that he was here. Who told you that? Was it because he reported directly to the Archbishop? Mr. Mason, the man was an opportunist. He was brought here for a simple audit and he turned it into an inquisition. I understand you left a successful business career to join the church. I came here because I felt that my talents would be appreciated and I could work on something I believed in. So being removed from this position would be a terrible blow. Tell me, Monsignor,
What would you have done if you had found this recommendation? Mr. Mason, I deeply resent your implications. I don't blame you. Good day, sir. Peter? Peter. What's the matter? Monsignor Kaiser just called. He said this, this Mason fellow's taking up where only you left off. Ellen, calm down. Peter, I'm scared. Come with me. Look, I don't have much time. Mason's going to be here any second to see me. About what? What are you going to say to him? Ellen, for God's sake, pull yourself together. I'm not going to implicate you. We're in this together. Well, I've got to see you tonight. No, I can't. Carol's giving one of her parties. Well, tell her it's an emergency. Dr. Lattimore. I... I didn't mean to intrude. The nurse told me you were here. Uh, I'd like you to meet our administrator, Ellen Cartwright. How do you do? Nice to meet you. Um, I was just leaving. Thank you. So, how are you feeling? And never better. Your recuperative powers are amazing. It runs in the family. Well, I wish I could help you with Sister Margaret's defense. I've always liked her. Perhaps you can. I gather Father O'Neill felt the quality of medicine had fallen under your tenure. What did Father O'Neill know about the quality of medicine? He seemed to think you were driving good doctors away. That's ridiculous. Look, I'm not the problem. Go on. Well, you're going to find this out anyway. This hospital is habitually short of equipment and supplies. That's why those doctors left. There's never enough money. There's never enough money. The person in charge of the physical operation of the hospital is Mrs. Cartwright, is it not? That's right. And under the circumstances, I think Mrs. Cartwright is doing a terrific job. Under the circumstances, I'd be surprised if you didn't. I checked into the hotel around Tampa. So you did not see this man dressed as a priest go into the hotel? I already told the police everything I know. This will just take a second. I have a dozen people I want to see, and I'm running late. I didn't see any priests anywhere. Mr. Ellison, you live in Bayport. That's 15 minutes out of town, right? Right. Why didn't you go home? Well, to tell you the truth, I had too much to drink. I went to a party, and I didn't want to drive home. By the way, the night clerk said you checked in with your wife. Well, yeah, but she didn't see anything. I'd like to talk with her. I don't think she can help. Why? I already asked her. You'd be wasting your time. Well, you never know. Maybe I can uh, jog her memory. What's the number? <sighs> Look, I told her she didn't see anything. Mr. Allison, were you with your wife at the hotel? I think you'd better leave. Operator, yes, the number in Bayport for a Mr. and Mrs. Ellison, please. Just what the hell do you think you're doing? Thank you. I said leave. It's ringing. I saw your priest. Look, if my wife finds out what I was up to, she'll kill me. We'll keep you out of it. My friend and I were coming into the back entrance of the hotel. This priest gets out of a red and white cab, follows us in. You don't see priests sneaking in and out of hotels very often. We thought it was funny. Did you see him go upstairs, go into a room? I saw him get out of the cab and come in. That's it. That's enough. Logan was seen arriving at the Mayfair Hotel in a cab. Have you spoken to the dispatcher? For a small sum, which I'm sure you'll reimburse me for at a later date. He gave me the name of the driver. I know where to look for him this afternoon. Oh, we need Logan. I'll find him, I'll find him. What did uh, you come up with? Well, we've been over the hospital records. The good father was correct. Someone is stealing them blind. You're late for your meeting. No hat? 
No kiss? Oh. <laughs> Let me take a look. Here you go. Where is Sister Margaret? She's in church. Well, good. Good. How is she? She could use a friend, Paul. Why are you looking at me? What happened between you two? Nothing. Well, I don't know what it was, but she's very upset. You know, everyone around here is shunning her. She's alone, Paul, and she's scared. Am I interrupting? Sit down. I got a new lead on Logan. You don't seem very excited. I'm sorry. I, I think I just have other things on my mind right now. Margaret, you're on trial for murder. What could be more important than that? You wouldn't understand. Try me. How would you feel if you had spent six years of your life preparing for something and then you didn't know if it was right there's a name for that it's called cold feet it's not that what is it then i don't know if i can take my final vows why not I've never admitted this to anyone before. But I was attracted to Father O'Neill. And I tried not to be. And I couldn't help myself. I, I couldn't control myself, Paul. And I don't know if I'm fit to be a nun. Margaret. You're a human being. You, you have feelings for... Like everybody else. There are higher standards of conduct in the church. And I've failed them. You're being too hard on yourself, Margaret. I don't know. Maybe it's me. I, I can't live with these doubts anymore, and I have, to, I have to find a way to prove myself. Well, I'm sure if anybody can, you can. Do you really think so? Margaret, you are the most obstinate woman I have ever met. <laughs> And I have no doubt that whatever you set your mind to, you can do. Come on, buy a lunch. Mm. Your experience in real estate seems to have served you well. Actually, I built this place. I wasn't referring to your house. Mr. Mason. Good, you're here. I uh, wanted to go over some of the real estate transactions that have been made for the church. I thought you might have something to add. Anything specific? Yes. Possibly you could explain this to me. Mr. Mason, for every property I've sold at a loss, I can show you ten that were profitable to the church. That isn't the point, Mr. Shea. 
I can make a strong case that you've systematically sold off the church's most valuable properties to your clients and associates. Nothing illegal about selling property to people I know. At the very least, your ethics could be questioned. What about you, Mr. Eastman? You were the accountant for the church at the time of all these transactions. Weren't you supposed to be guarding the church's interest? We're an accounting firm. We're not investment counselor. Mr. Mason, is this the best you can do in defense of this nun? <laughs> Mr. Shea, what would happen to your law firm if the church accused you of fraud? I won't dignify a question like that with a reply. I can understand why, Counselor. Della told me you found Logan. Cab driver said he picked him up right over there. Perry, this is no place for you. This is no place for either of us. Your timing's perfect. There he is. Excuse me. Why did we have to wait over 20 minutes for you to arrive? We were busy. With that outfit, waiting 20 minutes is nothing. Why don't they do something about it? The hospital's got an exclusive contract with this ambulance service. In my humble opinion, they haven't got the men or the vehicles to do the job. But the hospital won't change companies. You're very lucky. Here, hold that. It's just a flesh wound. You feel weak? No. Why? You lost some blood. What happened? Somebody took a shot in the dark. Did you see who? No. How is he, doctor? He's going to be just fine. I'll have the nurse bandage him up. You all right? Yeah, fine. The, uh, the good doctor wanted to know if I saw who shot me. Really? Well, now that Logan is dead, what do we do? 
You can start by finding out who owns that ambulance service. I'm going to find out what's in this syringe. find out who owns the Centurion Ambulance Service. Can I sue? What? The leg. Oh, oh, no, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm in kind of a hurry. Clock me. seconds. I'm very impressed. I've done better. Is that right? Huh. You got what you want? Looks like some kind of holding company. Thank you. You've been cooperative, quick, and courteous. What's your name? Oliver Latham. Oliver. How do you do? Listen, do you have a card? Because I might have a few more questions I want answered, and I know I can trust them to you. Oliver, thank you very much. Could you describe the defendant's condition when you arrived at the hotel? She appeared to be upset. What about her physical condition? Well, her jacket was ripped. Did she say anything to you? Yes. Did you explain her constitutional rights to her? I don't feel it was necessary at the time, you see. She wasn't a suspect then. She was not? No. What did she say to you at that time? She said that she had arrived the night before. She met Father Logan. He gave her some sherry. She became drowsy. She fell asleep. She was on the floor when the waiter arrived. They discovered Father O'Neill's body. During your subsequent investigation, did you discover anyone else besides the defendant who actually saw this Father Logan at the hotel? No, I did not. Hmm. Uh, during the investigation of the room, did you find a bottle of sherry or a glass? No, I did not. Hello. Well, may I help you? Oliver Latham, State Department of Corporations. Is there a problem? Our records show you failed to make your annual filings. Statements of current ownerships, Form 1001C and 902A, should have reached our office two months ago. Well, I think you're mistaken. Our administrator is very prompt about matters like that. Well, we didn't receive them. If you sent them, I certainly hope you have duplicates on hand. Well, I'm sure we do. I'll have to talk to the administrator. If you could just wait a minute. All right. I show you now People's Exhibit 3, and I ask you if you recognize it. So do it. That's the kitchen knife that's found in Paul O'Neill's suite. It has been stipulated by both Mr. Mason and myself that this knife was, in fact, the murder weapon. Were fingerprint tests run on this knife? Yes. One set of prints were found, a defendant's. Thank you. I have shown counsel, and I am now showing you a letter marked People's Exhibit 4 for identification. I ask you if you recognize this. Yes, that's the letter seized during the course of a search of the defendant's room. It has been stipulated that this letter was written by the decedent. Will you read the letter into the record, please? The letter says, my dear Margaret, I fear we have been compromised 
and risk ruining our careers. We'll both be better off if we put an end to it now and don't see each other again. I'm sorry, you deserve better. And assign Tom. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Your witness? Sergeant Brock, you personally saw the body of the man Sister Margaret identified as Father Logan? Yes, I did. No further questions. Drake, what do you think you're doing? let you do this i have to testify absolutely not mr mason i must reston will go after you he'll do whatever he can to make you lose your temper it'll be all right no it won't be all right if you give in to his provocation i'm sorry i have to do this margaret listen to me brock's testimony hurt you we can't take the risk mr mason i know how hard you've worked and please understand, this has nothing to do with the trial. What are you saying? I have studied to be a nun for six years. And if I'm not equal to this test, I don't deserve to take my final vows. It's a question of faith. Sister Margaret, are you testifying of your own free will and volition? Yes, sir, I am. And would you please tell this court why you chose to be a witness? I wanted everybody to hear the truth from me. Then I ask you for once and all time, did you or did you not murder Father Thomas O'Neill? No, sir, I did not. Thank you. Your witness. Sister Margaret, don't most priests live at the rectory? Yes. So by staying at a hotel, wasn't it easier for Father O'Neill to see you? Well, that's not why he lived Yes at or a... no? Sister Margaret, wasn't it easier for Father O'Neill to see you? Yes. And in point of fact, on the night of the murder, didn't Father O'Neill call you and tell you to come to his hotel room? Yes, he did. Had you been there before? Several times. Yes, exactly how many times? Uh, once, twice? Four or five. Had you ever been to his room at such a late hour before? No. And yet you thought nothing of going? No. Hmm. Sister Margaret, how did you feel about Father O'Neill? Did you like him? Yes. Did you find him attractive? Your Honor, I object. Irrelevant. Sustained. We have heard testimony that you were seen holding Father O'Neill's hand in public. Is that true? I cut my finger and he was looking at it. You gave him an expensive gift, didn't you? No. No, I, I didn't. I call your attention to People's Exhibit 4. Do you recognize this uh, letter written by Father Thomas O'Neill to you? No. Sister Margaret, we have the testimony of a handwriting expert. This was written by Father O'Neill. 
Would you like to reconsider your testimony? Sergeant Brock showed that letter to me, and that was the very first time that I saw it. This was addressed to you. This was found in your room, and yet you're saying you never received it? That's right. You want us to believe you didn't get this note? You want us to believe you didn't give him the gift? Sister Margaret, isn't it true you were in love with Father O'Neill? I object. This is irrelevant. Your Honor, Mr. Mason and his client have opened the door to this line of questioning. Your Honor, the prosecutor's questions exceed the scope of direct examination. I loved Father O'Neill. Oh. Oh. And you had an affair? No. Really? Sister Margaret, didn't you just testify that you visited his room on more than one occasion? Yes, but I... Please, Sister Margaret, yes or no? Wasn't that your testimony? Yes, but you make it seem as when if I went... When you got the note terminating the relationship, didn't you go to his room? He called me and he said... Yes or no, Sister Margaret? Yes. Thank you. Didn't you beg him to take you back, yes or no? No. Didn't he tell you the relationship had to come to an end? Yes, but the relationship... Isn't it true there was a fight? No. And in the fight, didn't your jacket get ripped? No. And the crucifix torn from your neck? No. Sister Margaret, isn't it true you were Father O'Neill's lover? No. He rejected you? No. You killed him. not true. No further questions. There's someone else on trial here. Someone whose voice can never be heard. Father Thomas O'Neill was a good and an honest priest. And there's not a person in this courtroom who can question his integrity. He never broke his vows with me. I never broke mine with him. Counselor, your next witness. Your Honor, may I have a minute with my associate? One minute. Get it here as fast as you can. Mr. Mason? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I uh, call Mrs. Ellen Cartwright to the stand. Mrs. Cartwright, you are the administrator of St. Mark's Hospital, is that correct? Yes. Is your job there your sole source of income? Yes. Don't you have any investments? Few. Would one of them be the Centurion Ambulance Service? Yes, I have uh, some money in that company. Centurion serves a number of hospitals, does it not? Yes. And one of them is your hospital, St. Mark's? Yes. Mrs. Cartwright, isn't it true that you and your partners are the sole owners of the Centurion Ambulance Service? I really don't see what the... Please, just answer the question. Yes, it's true. One last question. And Mrs. Cartwright, I remind you, you are under oath. Now, who is your partner in the Centurion Ambulance Service? Doctor... 
Peter Lattimore. Your witness? No questions. Dr. Lattimore, you are a partner in the Centurion Ambulance Service, is that correct? Yes, I am. You are also the chief of medicine at St. Mark's Hospital, is that correct? Yes. Last Friday night in the emergency room of St. Mark's Hospital, did you treat Paul Drake for a gunshot wound? Yes, I did. How did you happen to be at the hospital at that hour? Were you on call? No. Were you looking after a patient? I don't remember. It may have been a post-op. Dr. Lattimore, weren't you at a restaurant with friends and weren't you called to the phone by your service? I don't remember. Didn't you rush out without finishing your dinner? I said I don't remember. Doctor, do you usually treat patients in the emergency room? No. Yet you sent the young resident, Dr. Williams, away and treated Paul Drake yourself? Yes. Did you examine his wound? Yes. What was the indicated treatment? It was superficial. I had the nurse bandage it up. Was any medication required? Only what was necessary to cleanse the wound. Doctor, are you familiar with the drug potassium chloride? Of course I am. Could you describe its usage? It's used for um, irregular heart rhythms, fainting, particularly for people on diuretics. But if administered in a large enough dose, it would induce cardiac arrest and would be fatal. Yes. And in a fatal dose, would be almost impossible to detect by autopsy. Yes. Dr. Lattimore, would there have been any reason to give this drug to Paul Drake? No. Now, if I were to show you a syringe from St. Mark's Hospital, taken from the emergency bay after you treated Paul Drake, wouldn't it be filled with a fatal dose of potassium chloride? I don't know. Dr. Lattimore, isn't it true you received a phone call from someone who ordered you to the hospital to kill Paul Drake? Your Honor... Isn't it true that the person who called you knew you embezzled money from the hospital for your investments, including the Centurion Ambulance Service? Multiple uh, isn't it true that the Honor. person who called you ordered Logan... Mr. Jeff Mason! ...to kill Father O'Neill? Mr. Mason! This court will come to order. Mr. Rustin, your objections are sustained. Thank you. I have no further questions, Your Honor. But I would like to reserve the right to recall this witness to the stand. Mr. Reston? I have no questions at this time. Step down. I call Miss Gladys Terry. Miss Terry. Please tell the court where you work. The medical phone service. We're the city's oldest answering service for doctors. Do you handle Dr. Lattimore's calls? Yes, sir, we do. Can you tell me if he received a call at approximately 10 o'clock last Friday night? If he did, it'll be right in here. Your Honor, Paul Drake was shot at Logan's Hotel by Logan's Confederate. Only the person who shot him could have called Dr. Lattimore and told him to finish the job. Now, Miss Terry, what did you find? At 10.30 Friday night, Dr. Lattimore received a call from a gentleman who said it was an emergency. We put him through. And who was that gentleman? Mr. Jonathan Eastman. Oh, 
Your witness. No questions. You may step down. Your Honor, at this time, I would like to recall Dr. Peter Lattimore to the stand. All right. We embezzled the money together. And Eastman was our partner. But he had the priest killed, O'Neill. It was all his idea. He did. People move for a dismissal. Case dismissed. All rise. better when you were on the bench. Thank you, Counselor. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific. Now, remember, you heard it here first. You are right. I am the most obstinate woman that you have ever met. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. As soon as I can, I'll come down to L.A. I'd like that. Thanks, Perry. Well, let's see. I've been half frozen. I've been shot. Missed my trip to Tahiti. And what do I get? Thanks. <laughs> Frank said he got here about two minutes ago, so let's just go in. Okay, guys, come on. What are you doing here? I wanted to get a shot of you arriving at work. I thought this was going to be just an interview. Oh, it is, but I thought it would be nice to open with you starting your day. Would you mind taking another sip of coffee? Yes, I would. Perry, we finally got a response from those people at Harvard. What's going on? A very good question. I think we can cut here. You ready? Mr. Mason, is there any kind of client that you wouldn't handle? Yes. One who lied to me. Perry, I got that. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Hi. Excuse me. Mr. Melansky and I need a moment alone. Of course. Well, I got Williamson's statement, but... I don't think it's going to help our case much. Young lady, your interview, this interview, is over. I do not want you disrupting my office. I'm just trying to add a dimension of reality, sort of um, television verite, if you know what I mean. Look, Charlie, it is Charlie, isn't it? Yes, it is. Check with Ms. Street. Make a date for me to come to your station. I'll do as long a law day interview as you wish. Okay. Can I still use the footage I took today? Damn it, girl. Mr. Mason, I 
I realize that we're intruding, but I, I'm really trying to go for sort of a naturalistic thing, you know? And uh, I, I do keep my word. I won't use any footage unless you approve first, okay? That's a wrap. Okay, folks, stand by. Uh, bring up camera there for me, would you, Phil? Uh, tighten that up a little bit. Yeah, that's nice right there. Hold it. Thanks. Jeff, when can I get some time in here to do some online? Uh, maybe tonight. Uh, I'll let you know. Thanks. Okay. okay, let's do this. And now, Rand Cosmetics once again brings you the whole truth as revealed by the one, the only, Ted May. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thanks very much. And to everyone at home watching our live show today, welcome. Today, the spotlight of Revelations falls on Judge Joshua Cohn. Now, I invited the good judge here today to discuss a certain weekend he's rumored to have spent recently at a law conference in Los Angeles, but he declined. Oh. However, I did manage to track down someone who was at that alleged conference with him. Please welcome his alleged research assistant. This is Miss Carrie McCloskey. Carrie. <laughs> Welcome. I love your outfit. Have a seat there, Carrie. Now, Carrie, this research that you did for the judge down in L.A., just exactly what kind of briefs did it entail, anyway? <laughs> he is the first really bona fide hit I've had since I started this network. <laughs> he does get away with murder, doesn't he? Yes, he does. God love him. <laughs> and he hasn't done too badly by you, either. Sponsoring a show is one of the two best decisions I've ever made. The second was to become engaged to him. Makes his contract negotiations a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, you've been a great guest today. I want to thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for Carrie McCloskey, Judge Cohen's girl, Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Carrie, thank you. Before we close today's show, I have an announcement, a very important announcement. It's here. Everything you wanted to know about me, Ted Maine, but we're afraid to ask, has finally been revealed. Yes, indeed. The truth is out, and not just the truth about me and my many thrilling adventures, but also about some special women I've known and loved before, all in intimate detail. So whether it's the famous star of her own TV series, and I'm referring, of course, to the lovely Roxanne Shields, the star of the hit TV series, Undercover. Another special lady in my life is the widow of a celebrated congressman, Mrs. Nora Turner. Turnabout's fair play, and now the sometimes harsh spotlight of truth falls on me. So whether I tell you all about my romance with the high fashion photographer, or whether it's closer to home and you get to meet a sophisticated and beautiful television producer, I can only warn you that if you pick up this book, you won't put it down. It's all true, it's all in here, and it all goes on sale tomorrow. So you've been a great audience. This is Ted Main saying, watch yourself, because we just may be watching you too. See you tomorrow. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Were you aware he even had a book? Not me, you're his producer. You didn't know about this? No. You must have known. Oh, I read the galley. You read the galleys. You're going to marry him. How can you let him publish a kiss and tell book? But it all happened before we met, so why should I care? Besides, this should push his ratings and my company's sales to an all-time high. Uh, if you two will excuse me, I'm going to go congratulate our star. So tell me, what does he say about me? Plenty. That SOB. <laughs> yes, but he's our SOB. <gasps> oh, Perry Mason. Very big time stuff. 
It's almost as big a deal as this, or haven't you heard about my autobiography yet? The United Nations was all abuzz. <laughs> Came by to bring you your very own copy. Check it out, it's a good read. Is there any... Oh, that's very nice of you, Ted, but I haven't finished reading Mein Kampf. Read it, Charlie, tonight, because tomorrow you're going on special assignment, interviewing all the women I've known and loved. <laughs> Ted, I don't know if you've forgotten, but I don't work for you. You do this time. Says who? Harold Tyson. You remember Harold, the man who signs your paychecks? Ted, I'm doing this piece on Perry Mason. Cool down, Charlie. Mason can wait. This just became the hottest story in show business. I really like your show. Oh, thank you. Have you read Ted Main's book? No, I haven't. Are you going to? Um, I have much better things to do with my time, thanks. Roxanne, how do you feel about Ted Main? What? The next time I see him, I'm gonna grab this for his rotten little heart! Roxanne, don't you just leave me alone, us. okay? When David died in that plane crash, well, it was quite a blow for me and my daughter. Sandra had school, of course, so she recovered fairly quickly. Why are you talking to them? Can't you just leave her alone? Let's cut. I want to have my say. This is important to me. Go ahead, Mrs. Turner. Anyway, after David's death, I became a virtual recluse. Then about two years ago, I met Ted. In a way, he brought me back to life. So are you saying you're glad you had your affair with him? In hindsight, no, of course not. But at the time, he was very supportive. I was vulnerable, and you might say that he took advantage of me. I had no idea that he'd end up sharing our relationship with the world. That's all I have to say. Excuse me. Make sure you get a shot of that picture of her and Turner over there. Okay. See you back at the station. All right. Hi, Beth, it's me. Um, listen, did you have any luck finding that fashion photographer, Mary Singer? Well, she's got to be somewhere. Where does she know May from? A hotel. Great. Well, did you try this hotel? Uh huh. Okay. Well, I gotta go. Keep keep trying. Okay. Okay. Promise me. I need it. I've spent my life getting permission from people. I don't intend to get it from you. Mom, I'm only trying to help. I'm sorry. I'm mad at Ted May, not you. Maybe I can repay him someday. This is my Miss Passion. Let's use her first, okay? And this is number two. Make sure you get the champagne glasses in this one. And this is a hot ticket. Oh. You are not gonna use that picture. Brenda, sweetheart, it's just a blob of what's already in the book. I don't care. 
How could you do this to me? Where's your sense of humor? I went out with you, didn't I? <gasps> Ted. Oh, hi, babe. Something's come up. Why the long face? There's something you better see. The next time I see him, I'm going to have this for his rotten little heart. Roxanne, don't... So Nora Turner gave me this hearts and flowers routine, and Mary Singer is nowhere to be found, but I think that Roxanne makes up for them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought you'd better know. This book is going to bring you nothing but trouble, and it serves you right. When are you going to stop being such a spoil sport? Besides, this is great stuff. In fact, I want to use a clip from that for my show today. Ted, she threatened you. You've got to be careful. In fact, I think maybe we should hire a bodyguard. Roxanne's not really capable of doing anything. You never know. I vote for the bodyguard. Everybody gets something straight. I've been in the news business 20 years. I've covered 12 wars, 2,000 stories. I've always watched my own back. I'm not going to start running scared because some hysterical woman threatens me with a Boy Scout knife. Now, I want a clip from that up to the booth because I'm running it on my show today. Okay? Excuse me. stand out. You think so? How long have I been working for you? I know so. <laughs> Listen to this. I've had six people ask me if you're really going to kill Ted Maine. Two of them volunteered to do it for you. You know, my agent's always telling me to get involved with something environmental. So I figured killing Ted would be right up there with saving the ozone layer, don't you? Tell me when you're going to do it. I'll hold his arms. What a creep playing that tape on a show like that. I guess that's what I get for being involved with him, right? Uh, what time is it? 5.30. I'm going to lie down for a little while. I've got an evening premiere and a 6 a.m. call. Life is hard, Annie. Yeah, and all you get in return is fame and fortune. I'll press this before I go. Thanks. Oh, and can you tell him to hold all my calls and wake me up at 8? Got you. Give my regards to your sister. Thanks. something? No, I just thought I saw someone I know come in here. Maybe I can help you, man or woman. 
I don't know that you. Do I know you from someplace? Never mind. I, I must have made a mistake. Thank you. Roxanne. Now, how would you know that? If you get to be my age, you know just about everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a pleasant surprise. I knew you weren't mad at me. Come on in, I'll make you a drink. Scotch knee, right? So what's with the scarf? It's not that cold out, is it? Any chance the lady in the red dress you saw getting off the elevator? I suppose it could have been. No, Arnie, it must have been. That's Roxanne. She had on a scarf. Yeah, and but sunglasses. Arnie, the perfume, remember? Excuse the me, perfume? excuse me. What about the perfume? Well, she was wearing this perfume, right? That she sells. It's called Roxanne. Arnie recognized it. Well, is that right, Arnie? I never forget a scent. Take your coat off yet. Why not? You just had a call from your TV friend, Roxanne Shields. Oh, you know, you sent her an invitation to the charity dinner. Of course she accepted. She's just been arrested for murder. She was calling from the police station. I mean, look, I, I admit being mad at Ted. I mean, who wouldn't be? The guy described every sexual encounter we ever had in graphic detail. I've never been so mad at anyone my whole life. Witnesses say the killer was wearing a red dress and the perfume you endorsed. I was getting ready to go to the premiere. And unfortunately, my assistant Annie was already on her way to Cleveland and can't confirm my whereabouts. Any idea how the killer could have known that you would be wearing a red dress? Hug. Oh, I don't know. I wear a lot of red. Maybe they just got lucky. Maybe. You know, I'm curious. Why did all those women find Maine so, so... Because... Because I... Guess he was a very good actor. He, um... He made you believe that you were very special and that he loved you. Sorry I'm late. Roxanne is my associate, Ken Malansky. Roxanne Shields. Nice to meet you. I just talked to Brock. They found the murder weapon, a knife. It was identical to the one Miss Shields used in that videotape. They found it in the trunk of your car. They think I am. Can't they tell that this is a frame? Miss Shields, I'm afraid they see it more like an airtight case. <sighs> Particularly after what I said on television. God, how could I have been so stupid? You know, a friend of mine once told me that he figured I became an actress because... I had a hard time handling reality. Oh, boy, was he right. Please, you... 
You gotta help me with this. I mean, I, I've never been so scared in my life. this case ever comes to trial. Do you have anything you'd like to say to me, Roxanne? You bet I do. I would like to be here. You work too hard. Roxanne, we You have heard what Mr. Mason said. Uh, I was talking to her. Roxanne? Excuse me. Hey. I said excuse me. Where were you? Where were you? So where to? Ted Main's apartment. We'll drop you off first. Do I have to see somebody? Uh, yeah, my name's Ken Melansky, and this is... Harry a... Mason. I've, I've got a thing for faces. Jamie Morsey, how you doing? We have permission to examine Mr. Main's apartment. Go right ahead. Oh, no, no. you got to use the uh, penthouse elevator over there. All right, thanks. Mr. Morrissey, you mentioned in your statement to the police that you saw a woman in a red dress get on the elevator. That's right. The penthouse elevator? Yeah. Did she seem to know where it was? Went straight to it. Did you see anyone else you didn't recognize down here that night? As a matter of fact, there was somebody. A guy, kind of tall, dark. Good looking, but mean looking, too. Uh, I know from someplace. Like I said, I got this thing for faces. Why didn't you mention that in your statement? Police never asked. They just wanted to know about the woman. Thank you, Mr. Morrissey. Well, there's nothing in here that wasn't in the police report. Ken, I, I've seen this place before, and I'm not talking about the photos taken by the police. Take a look in Maine's book, the pictures. This picture of Roxanne, it was taken in here. Right there on the couch. That's right. Please. Yep. The system was put in to record his meetings with mobsters. He probably figured out the other uses for the camera later on. A lot of those pictures were taken in here. And unless Maine brought those women up here blindfolded, all of them would know where that elevator was. The killer could be one of them. I've already asked Ella to do some background research on those ladies. Her birthday's coming up, you know. I know. What are you going to get her? I'm keeping that a secret. You mean you don't know yet? I'm also keeping that a secret. Thanks. Here's the idea. Roxanne Shields has Perry Mason, one of the most successful defense attorneys anywhere, right? The police have their suspect, they've made their case, they're through. But meanwhile, Mason is out looking for anything he can find to help get his clients off. All he needs to show is reasonable doubt. Which is a pretty tall order in this case. Yes, but not impossible. Especially not for Mason. All right, so just what is it you are proposing? Let me run an investigation parallel to Mason's. I'll be on top of everything he finds. We can keep the prosecution up to speed on what he's got. And that way we will have a pretty hot story. <sighs> I am not at all certain about the ethics of this thing. Laura, I'll defer to you. I knew the real Ted Maine, not just the showman. 
Everybody thought that was all there was to him. I loved him. Um, I don't want Perry Mason to get Roxanne Shields off if she's guilty. But if she didn't do it, I'd sure as hell like to know who did. I think we should do it. Okay, Michelle, we got the party scene, we got the restaurant scene, we got the living room, but I wonder if her orange dress is gonna clash with those red and white tablecloths, but... Ms. Sure. Kingsley, I'm Roxanne Shields' attorney. My name's Mason. Do you have time for some questions? Of course. You want to give me just about five minutes? So, questions about Ted and me? Basically, yes. Well, why don't you just read his book? I did. I take it your relationship was short-lived. Well, I discovered fairly quickly he liked a lot of ladies. And I didn't like that. You still produce his show. I produce several shows here. My personal feelings don't enter into it. You were angry when you learned that you were in the book? I was upset, yes. You had a very angry public argument with him the day he was murdered. Well, he wanted to use my picture in the show he was doing that day on his book. I objected. Where were you between 8 and 9 o'clock that night? I was right here. Going over costumes for a special that I'm producing. Ever wear red, Miss Kingsley? Rarely. But if you wanted to wear red, a dress, for instance, you'd know right where to come, wouldn't you? Yep. Hey, Della. Messages? I can, yeah. Here they are. Thanks. Oh, uh, Perry wants you to look at what I found on Mary Singer. It's in his office. All right. There you are. And where's the rest of it? That's it. You know, in his book, Ted Maine described her as a high-fashion photographer he met at the Regis Hotel. No agency's ever heard of her. Did you check the agencies in New York? Chicago, Los Angeles, everywhere. It's like she didn't exist. Well, Ted Maine sure is kissing somebody in this picture. <laughs> if her real name is Mary Singer, I'll eat my hat. If I had one. the outfit. You trying to get into another book? Don't be cute, Polly. Where have you been? Don't worry about it. If I'm supposed to let you know my every move, then I'd like to know yours. Just leave it alone. What are you up to? What's the gun for? It's none of your business. Because of what you did, sooner or later they're gonna come looking. And when they do, I'm gonna be ready. Sweet. Look what just came. I'd like you to get a knife just like that one. And then what? And then another, and another, and another. And maybe even one more. Mm -hmm. I think I can do that. Soon. Mom, I'm home! Thanks to Brian for Police Environmental.
Helpless and terrified residents. Mom? Mom? In news today, the Ted Main murder trial seems to be heating up with the bail hearing of TV star Roxanne Shields. Now we go live to Charlie Adams at the courthouse. Roxanne Shields is free today after posting bail of $100,000. Though no one will comment, rumor has it the fact that Ms. Shields was wearing red last night is central to the state's case. The woman seen entering Ted Main's apartment an hour before he was found murdered was also wearing red. And this is apparently too much of a coincidence. Sandra, I'm Roxanne Shields' attorney. I have an appointment to see your mother. Um, I don't think she's here. I just got back myself. My name is Mason. Mind if I ask you some questions? Um, all right. Come on in. What do you want to ask me about? This, mostly. Where'd you get this? We never distributed these. Well, there's been a lot of speculation that your mother would run for your father's seat. That's been canceled. Ted Maine pretty well took care of any political future my mother had, didn't he? She just started to get her life back together, and then he came along and tore it apart. Was your mother home the night he was murdered? She was at home with me. So, you both have an alibi. You have each other. Tell your mother I'll call again. Thank you for your help. I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to give out that kind of information. Ah, uh, come on, I'm investigating a murder here. You're not a cop, and you don't have a subpoena. Well, subpoenas take time. I'm after a killer, Hillary, and the longer we stand here talking, the colder the trail gets. Look, I'd like to help you, but... All I want is Mary Singer's address. That's all, I swear. All right, do you have any idea when she registered? Sometime last June, I think. Okay, hold on a sec. Singer. Mary Singer. I really appreciate this, Clarence. Anytime you want to come down and see a taping or whatever, you just let me know, okay? What are you doing here? I remember you. You're the guy who pushes people around for Perry Mason. What, what was your name again? Molansky. Ken Molansky. So why are you asking about Mary Singer? I have a nose for news. <laughs> Seriously, what do you want with her? The same thing you do. You're that reporter Charlie Adams, aren't you? Are you two together? No. no. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have any records of a Mary Singer. Okay. Thanks anyway. Well. I guess that's it for here, huh? Guess so, yeah. See you around, Malansky. We'll have somebody up here immediately. Well, thank you. Do you ever remember seeing this woman? 
Looks familiar. She was here last June. Well, it's a long time and a lot of people ago, my friend. I remember her. Beautiful woman, always acting mysterious. And boy, did she love the shop. Every time she came back, it took at least two of us to get all of her bags up to her room. As a matter of fact, she was here um, three times last year. Yeah, I remember her. Was she ever here with anybody? No, she was always alone. You remember anything else? She did a lot of shopping at Riddell's. Try that. All right, thanks a lot. My pleasure. That's right. Mr. Mason, were you looking for me? Yes. Your office has been very reluctant to make an appointment. I really don't have anything to say to you, Mr. Mason. Perhaps you'd answer just one question. What is that? When did you first read the galleys of Ted Main's book? <laughs> Why do you ask? My office spoke to Maine's publisher and got the exact date the galleys came out. Three days later, your company took out a $5 million insurance policy on Maine. What are you getting at? That book really upset you, didn't it? How dare you imply such a thing? I love Ted Maine, and we were going to be married. I think you are beneath contempt, Mr. Mason, so I will thank you to leave me alone. Do you hear me? Ms. Wren. I hear you, Ms. Wren. And so does everyone else. Don't they? So what kept you? Well, look who's here. Look, there's no point in us tripping over each other. Why don't we call it a truce and see if we can help each other out? We're both after the same thing. We are? Yeah, the truth. Ah, um, well, you know, I thought you and Mason were just interested in getting your client off. Well, in this case, our client happens to be innocent. Well, that remains to be seen. So are you coming or not? Give me one good reason. Well, you remember when you asked that salesman in there where you delivered something to Mary Singer? I told him to give you the wrong address. I got the right one here. That's one good reason. Miss Shields will be right with you. Thank you. Your relatives in Cleveland, how are they? Fine, thanks. Why? Well, you told Miss Shields you were going to Cleveland to visit them the night of the murder. You didn't make the trip. Look, Mr. Mason, I was supposed to work the weekend, but I wanted to spend some time with my boyfriend, so I lied. Do you have to tell Miss Shields? No. But I am interested in where you were the night of the murder. We were at a party. There's a dozen people can swear I was there all night. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Mason. Annie, have you gotten my prescription from the drugstore yet? I'll do it right after I take care of this. Excuse me. May I see your bedroom? My bedroom? Yep, your bedroom. What are you looking for? How the killer could have known what you were wearing. I was hoping there was a building across here so someone could have seen you dressed in red. Have you thought about what you're wearing to court? Good. So, Malansky, what do you want to be when you grow up? I could be half as good as Perry Mason. How about you? I'm good now. I'm just waiting for the world to recognize it. You're certainly giving them every opportunity. I thought maybe you were going to be the next Ted Mayne. You know, Ted Mayne used to be a damn good journalist. One of the best.
Shouldn't that place be around here somewhere? Five nine eight three five nine eight seven. Nine eight nine. This can't be it. Mary Singer. No, I'm afraid I've never heard of her. But Reverend, she had a freezer delivered to this address that was just last November. A freezer? Well, this is a church, not a restaurant. Well, you have a kitchen. Maybe she donated it. I don't know anything about any freezer or about this Mary Singer. I wish she had given us a freezer. We could use it. <laughs> Sorry. The people at the store must have given me the wrong address. Let's try the parcel service office. Thank you, Reverend. Yeah, thanks. This is Reverend Leary. Someone was just here asking about Mary Singer. There it is. Uh, there's no place to park. Look, you stay here. I will be right back. All right. Mary Singer? Mm -hmm. I found her credit card. I'm trying to return it to her. Why don't you just turn it over to the police? Because the police won't give me a reward. Okay. Mary and Paul Singer, 7920 Valley Way. Thank you very much. You bet. Identification, please. Well, you mind telling me what this is all about? This car's been reported stolen. What? What are you talking about? Just keep your hands where I can see them. Well, my wallet's in my right hand pocket. Do you mind if I get it? Okay. Charlie, run! They caught me! Go ahead, run! Get out of here! Hey, get her! Hey, hey, hey! Don't come in. What do you mean, don't come in? Ken just called. Good. Where is he? In jail. Jail? Mm-hmm. Little place about 40 miles from here called Georgetown. The police chief is waiting for your call. I'd like to speak to the chief of police, please. The name's Mason. Yes, I'll hold. Do you happen to know the best escort service in town? Not right offhand. Would you find out for me? Mm -hmm. You can use my phone. Oh. Thanks a lot, Miss Adams. My my wife will be thrilled. And again, I, I'm sorry about the mix-up. Oh, that's okay. These things happen. I called a cab for you. It's waiting outside. How sweet of you. Thank you. Where's Mr. Melansky? Uh, he's, um, he's still in the tank. The chief's on the phone checking out his story. Well, I guess I better be going. <laughs> thanks for everything. It was nice to meet you all. Oh, thanks. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.
Mary Singer? Right. Hmm. Now, you're the second person who's come in here today asking about her. Yeah, I know. In fact, that first woman, you know, the pushy one? Uh -huh. She's my girlfriend. Oh, why didn't you just ask her for the address? She lost it. Can you believe it? She is such a flake. Anyway, she was too embarrassed to come back here, so she sent me. Story of my life. Okay. Charlene Adams. Charlie Adams. Paul, she's that reporter. You're gonna scream? What are you doing here? What is your occupation? I'm a medical examiner employed by the county. In your professional capacity, did you perform a post-mortem examination of Ted Maine? Yes, I did. Have you established the time of death? Approximately between 8.15 and 8.30 on the evening of the 19th. Will you please tell the court the cause of death? Ted Maine was killed with a knife wound in the chest, which punctured his aorta. Have you had the opportunity to examine this knife marked State Exhibit B? Yes, I have. Did you find blood traces on this knife? Yes. Were you able to determine if the blood on this knife matches Ted Maine's? Yes, it does. No further questions. At about 7.30 the morning after the murder, we responded to a call from the supervisor of uh, Ted Maine's building. And who discovered Mr. Maine's body? Uh, the maid had come in to clean, and she saw the body uh, lying on the carpet. Did you interview the defendant that morning? Well, yes, I did. What prompted you to do that? Well, well she had publicly uh, threatened him with bodily harm. Could the defendant account for her whereabouts at the time of the murder? Well, she stated that she was in her apartment alone. I call your attention to State's Exhibit B. Do you recognize it? Yes, it has my mark on it. Mm -hmm. When did you first see this knife, Lieutenant? Uh, that morning. It was in the trunk of Miss Shields' car. Well, thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions. She came out of the elevator, and she went straight toward Mr. Maine's apartment. Did you get a good look at her? Yes, I did. At least I got a good look at what I could see of her. What do you mean, Mr. Wyman? Well, she was all bundled up, kind of like the way she is now. That's the woman you saw that night? The defendant? Yes, yes it is. Aside from the way she was dressed, did you notice anything else about her? Well, yes. Uh, she was wearing Roxanne. You know, the perfume. Are you an expert on perfumes, Mr. Wyman? Well, somewhat. Uh, I like women, you see, and at my age, in order to enjoy their company, I often have to throw what you might call perks into the relationship. Perks? Yeah, you know, flowers, champagne, perfumes, that sort of thing. And as a result, I know my flowers, I know my champagnes, and I know my perfumes. So you're sure that the woman you saw that night was wearing Roxanne? Absolutely. No more questions. Mr. Mason. 
Defense has no questions, Your Honor. Next witness. Uh, the state calls Mr. James Morrissey. You're excused. About how far away from her were you when you saw her? About 30 feet. Saw her clear as a bell. And do you see that woman in this courtroom today? Yes, sir. She's right there. Let the record show that the witness pointed to the defendant. How was your eyesight, Mr. Morrissey? 2020. You don't wear contacts or glasses? No, sir. And you are absolutely certain it was the defendant you saw that night? Yes, sir. Your witness. What time did you see this woman, Mr. Morrissey? About 8 o'clock. And how was the woman you saw dressed? Just like she is now. What color were her eyes? Well, I don't know. She was wearing dark glasses, like she's got on now. What color was her hair? Red. But if she was wearing a scarf, how could you tell? Are you just assuming her hair was red because Roxanne Shields' hair is red? Look, all I know is that's the woman I saw that night. And you are sure? Positive. Are you sure it wasn't that woman? Or what about that woman? Or could it have been this woman? Well? No, it was her. I'm positive. Would you mind? Let the record show that this witness, like Mr. Wyman before him, has identified not Roxanne Shields, but Jenny Tessier, an employee of a local escort service. <laughs> Roxanne Shields is the woman now standing in the rear of the courtroom. No further questions. Della, any word from Ken? Uh -uh, not yet. I'm worried. So am I. Mr. Mason? Yes? We'd like to talk. See you back in the office. Everything's fine. Yes, he is. He work with you? Yes, he does. Why are you holding him? Because he and the young lady have stumbled onto two people we have in the witness protection program. We found Mary Singer and her brother. His real name's Paul Danton. She's his sister, Marie. They're both due in court this summer to give key testimony on some top organized crime people. As you can imagine, your finding them causes us some problems. I'm sorry for any inconvenience. But I need both witnesses in court tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Now, wait a minute. That would require us to relocate them with new identities. My client is on trial for murder. Their testimony will be important. I'd like them in court at 9 o'clock. You've got a lot of nerve, Mr. Mason. I wouldn't think you'd want it publicized on television how these two young people found your protected witnesses. I'll have them there. Now, where's the young lady? Mary arranged for your release. Great. Thought we were supposed to be in this together. I didn't think I could trust you. Well, right now, the only thing I know for sure is that I can't trust you. Is there more to this lecture? No. Welcome. Uh, Your Honor, uh, page 94. Page 94, Mr. Prosecutor. 
Uh, Ms. Danton, you have in your hand a copy of Ted Main's book, opened to page 94. Would you identify the woman in the picture, please? It's me. I told Ted my name was Mary Singer and that I was a fashion photographer because I obviously couldn't tell him my real name. When was that picture taken? Last year in June. When you saw your picture in Ted Main's book, what was your reaction? I was scared. I was afraid my brother's enemies would recognize me and eventually trace us to our new home. Were you angry? <laughs> yes, mostly at myself. Where were you the evening of March 19th? Objection. Relevancy. Miss Danton is not on trial here. Your Honor, the state contends that my client is guilty in large part because she had a motive for killing Ted Main and an alibi that cannot be substantiated. I intend to show that she is not the only person who meets those criteria. Overruled. Witness is instructed to answer the question. I was home in Georgetown that night. With your brother? No. You were alone. My brother came back at 8 o'clock. How can you be so sure of the time? I was watching TV and I switched to a program I wanted to see. No further questions? No questions. Defense calls Mr. Paul Danton. How did you feel when you saw that picture, Mr. Danton? I was mad as hell. At whom? My sister. And that creep Maine for telling the world stuff any normal man would have kept himself. Where were you the evening of the 19th? Objection. Mr. Mason calls everybody who had a reason to dislike Ted Maine to the stand. We could be here for months. Your Honor. Yes, I know. Objection overruled. Witness will answer the question, please. I was out driving around. You ended up in the lobby of Ted Main's apartment building, did you not? The concierge of that building is sitting right back over there. Now, you remember him? You do remember him? Yeah, I was there that night. And what did you do while you were there? Nothing. I never got the chance. He saw me, so I left. What did you intend to do? We'll take care of business. Kill him? Objection. He's badgering the witness. Overruled. Mr. Mason? Did you want to kill him? He wasn't worth it. You didn't slip in later when Mr. Morrissey's back was turned? No, I went home. On your way home, you stopped at a convenience store in Idaho Springs, a town over... 20 miles from your house, did you not? Yeah, to pick up cigarettes, odds and ends. Well, then I stopped for a beer. So what? Are you aware that later on that evening there was a holdup in that store? I read about it in the paper. Now, the police have supplied us with a copy of the surveillance tape of the night of the robbery. It shows that you were there at 8.30. If necessary, I can introduce it into evidence. What's your point? The tape proves you couldn't have been home by 8 o'clock, as your sister testified. It's over half an hour from town to Idaho Springs. That proves I couldn't have killed Maine. The tape gives me an alibi. Exactly my point. You have an alibi. But your sister does not. No further questions. No questions. Defense calls Brenda Kingsley. Who broke off your affair, you or Ted Main? I did. It was at about that time that you applied for a job with another television company. That's right. Isn't it true that you didn't get that job because Ted Main made a phone call to one of the company's executives? That was a rumor. I didn't pay much attention to it. What if I produce several co-workers who will testify that you were furious at the time, that you threatened Main? Well, that was a long, long time ago. Where were you between 8 and 9 o'clock the evening of the 19th, Miss Kingsley? I was in a costume warehouse. With whom? I was alone. No more questions. No questions. Defense calls Nora Turner to the stand. 
I understand that before this book was published, you planned to run for your late husband's seat in Congress. That's right. You still plan to run? Not now. Where were you the night Ted Maine was murdered? I was home with my daughter. The two of you were at home that night? Yes. Who's Gary Hazelton? He's my boyfriend. We're going steady. Isn't it true that on the night Ted Maine was murdered, you were with Gary? Objection. Leading. Overruled. Mr. Mason. Isn't it true that on the night Ted Maine was murdered, you were with Gary? I was at home with my mother. Mr. Hazelton, would you please stand? Sandra, unless you tell me the truth, I'll have to put your friend on the stand. If he lies for you under oath, he'll go to jail. Is that what you want? No. I wasn't home that night. I was out with Gary. Thank you, Mr. Hazelton. The day I came to your house, something was burning in the fireplace, a red dress. You were trying to destroy it, were you not? Yes. Was that because you suspected your mother was the one who killed Ted Maine? Speak up, Sandra. Yes. I have no more questions. No questions, Your Honor. Witness is excused. And I think we'll break here for lunch. Court is in recess until 2.30. As long as you don't touch anything. Well, it looks like Nora Turner did it, huh? She certainly could have. What are you doing here? There are still a couple of missing pieces. So what are your chances of proving Roxanne Shields innocent? Charlie. Do something for me, will you? Go over there and open that chest. I I'm sorry, what chest? That chest. And bring me the camera you put in it. Ted Maine would be proud. I'm an investigative reporter. That so? I just want the real story, Mr. Mason. At what cost to yourself? What, what is that supposed to mean? You're not above using rumor or innuendo, are you? I do what I have to do to get the truth. Charlie, what you have to do is to make sure it's possible to tell the difference between you and Ted Maine. And you can't. If I were running your network, I'd give you Ted Maine's show. You'd be a perfect replacement. Can I quote you on that? Definitely. What was that all about? Just exchanging points of view. She could use a new one. She's a good reporter, Ken. She's a bright and talented young woman. I like her. You could have fooled me. And that's not so easy. Those are the police photos? Yeah. Okay. Ted Maine comes home. He takes a shower. He pours himself a drink. And that's when the killer comes. Now, since there's no sign of forced entry, he probably let the killer in himself. And since a glass of brandy with his fingerprints all over it was sitting out on the bar, the glass of scotch that was found on the floor must have been meant for his killer. So he pours him or her a drink, turns around and gets stabbed in the chest. 
drops the glass, falls to the floor, and dies. How did whatever was sitting there, how did it get broken? It's a bull. Maybe he staggered into it and knocked it over. No, he would have left a trail of blood both ways. Why should that have been broken? Doesn't make sense. How did the killer know Roxanne would be wearing a red dress that night? That doesn't make sense either. Maybe her assistant told someone. No, no reason to. Look. You take the red dress. I'll take the bull. Surprise. Look, Mason just raked me over the coals. I really, I don't need it from you two. Well, I got news for you. Mason actually likes you. <laughs> got a pretty funny way of showing it. Well, part of his charm, I guess. Now I gotta go. Wait. I've been thinking. Um, I want to help. Now just listen a second, okay? I I realize that I've been fairly obnoxious, and um, I feel really bad about what happened the other day. Is that enough of an apology for you? Ken. Please don't make this any tougher for me than it already is. Get in. Mind if I ask you a question? I wouldn't know how to stop you. Are we going somewhere specifically, or are we just out for a drive. Okay, here's the plan. The killer had to know that Roxanne was going to wear a red dress the night of the murder. Well, yeah, so I heard about Mason's little trick in the courtroom, all those mysterious ladies in red. Very smart. Wish we had been there. Sorry. As I was saying, I was on my way to Roxanne's suite at the Hotel St. Clair. So you're going to figure out how the killer knew about that dress? I want to try. Ken? Yes? I think you're going about this entirely the wrong way. What are you talking about? The Hotel Sinclair? It's back that way. You should have turned left about six blocks ago. I knew that. Just seeing if you're paying attention. Thank you, Miss Street, for agreeing to testify. Proceed, Mr. Mason. Miss Street, this is the murder weapon. Now, I recently asked you to buy a knife identical to the one in this photo, did I not? It's similar to the murder weapon. Yes, you did. And were you able to do that? Yes, I was. With what degree of success? Bailiff. I found a dozen similar knives. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to request that those knives be entered into evidence as defense exhibits 15... 16, 17, 18, through 26. I object! Your Honor, anyone could have gone out and bought a knife just like the ones on that table and the one in that photograph and used it to kill Ted Main and then planted it in Roxanne's car. Objection! Now Mr. Mason is testifying. Thank you, Miss Street, that's all. No questions. Are you trying to say that I helped somebody frame Roxanne? No. No. Not at all. Maybe you told somebody about the dress inadvertently? The only person I talked to about that dress was Roxanne. Was the dress in this room the whole time? Yes. You didn't need to press it or anything? Of course, but it only took a couple of minutes. Can you show us where you pressed it? 
This is where I did it. Um, I have much better things to do with my time, thanks. Roxanne, how do you feel about Ted Maine? What? The next time I see him, I'm gonna lay up this for his rotten little heart! Did you mean it when you said that, Ms. Shields? Of course not. Then why did you say it? Because I was hurt. And I was humiliated, and I was mad, but I never would have really killed him. We've heard Mr. Wyman swear under oath that the woman who went up to Ted Maine's apartment the night he was murdered was wearing Roxanne perfume. Now, it's called Roxanne because you endorse it. Is that correct? Yes. Is this the perfume you endorse? It's the Roxanne bottle. Yes, this is Roxanne. Would you put some on your left wrist, please? One would assume that because you endorse Roxanne perfume, you also wear it. One would assume that, yes. In point of fact, you do not wear it, do you? No. You do not wear any perfume, do you? No. Isn't it true that you are so allergic to the ingredients commonly found in perfume that you take antihistamines just to be in the same room with women who do wear perfume? Yes, that is very true. If you try wearing even a little perfume, what happens? This happens. Is this what you were looking for? Depends on the view. You've seen four rooms already. The view is basically the same. Well, some are better than others. Milanski? Looks like this is the one. Looks like you're right. Good news. Roxanne's hotel, there's a room in an adjacent wing that looks directly into Annie Bullen's office. And that's how the killer knew what Roxanne was wearing the night of the murder. See, she rented the room and she watched Annie press the dress. Actually, we figured that much out thanks to Charlie. Who rented the room? Well, we know that it was a woman. She stayed one night and she paid cash. She registered under the name of Jane Johnson. They only remember that she wore a scarf and sunglasses. But when we talked to the maid who cleaned the room after she checked out, she said she remembered one thing vividly. Whoever stayed in that room was a smoker. The maid said the wastebasket was full of cigarette butts. She remembered it vividly because that room's on a non-smoking floor. Dellum, find out the date of Ted Maine's birthday. Mm -hmm. Ken, talk to the maid. Find out what brand that woman smoked. Right away. Perry, tomorrow's Della's birthday, you know. Shh. I'm trying to keep it a secret. What'd you get her? Remember, I'm also keeping that a secret. I could have gone to my network with all of this, you know. Yes, I know. You're not surprised that I didn't? No. I am pleased. Perry. Ted Maine were engaged to be married. Is that right, Ms. Rand? Yes, it is. How long had you known him? Mm, we met about a year ago when Rand Cosmetics became the sole sponsor of the show. You became engaged when? Within a month. We fell in love almost instantly. And after he published this book in which he described his affairs with various women in extensive detail, how did you feel about him then? I still loved him. All those affairs happened long before he met me. You didn't feel angry or resentful? Of course not. It was ancient history. 
Isn't it also ancient history that you suffer from a psychotic kind of jealousy? Objection. Relevancy. Sustained. Your birthday's when, Ms. Rand? August 7th. Ted Main's birthday? April 24th. So, according to astrology, he was a, um, a... A Taurus. Taurus. Taurus the bull. You believe in astrology, don't you, Ms. Rand? It's harmless fun. Last year for his birthday, didn't you give Ted a present? A ceramic bull, identical to this one? Yes, I gave Ted a statue like that, yes. Where were you the night your fiancé was murdered, Ms. Rand? I was home, alone. Your Honor, I have no more questions of this witness, but I reserve the right to recall her at a later time. Mr. Kelly, what time did you go on duty as night manager at the Hotel Sinclair on March 19th? 3 p.m. sharp. I'm never late. Never. Is it true that room 1502 in the east wing of the Hotel Sinclair has a view towards the south wing where your luxury suites are located? Yes, sir, that is correct. Do you recall who checked into that room on March 19th? Yes, sir. She called herself Jane Johnson. You say called herself? You had reason to doubt her name? Well, she insisted on paying cash. She refused to show any identification or credit cards. She wore dark sunglasses and a high scarf. Well, you know, like a celebrity or something. Can you describe her in any other way? Yes. She was about five foot six inches tall, dark hair, excellent figure, marvelous perfume. Would you say she was about the same size as Laura Rand? That's the woman sitting just in back of the prosecutor? Yes. But you can't positively identify her? No, sir. No. Mr. Hartman, you have in your hand Defense Exhibit 15, a knife like the one used to kill Ted Main. Is it true that you sell those at your hunting shop? Yes, sir, definitely. Do you recall selling a knife like that to a woman on the 19th of March? Yes, uh, definitely the afternoon of the 19th I did. What makes you so sure? Well, Mr. Mason, I sell a lot of handguns to women, but a knife like this, I hardly ever sell one of these to a woman. So I remember it clearly. Can you describe the woman? <laughs> She's built uh, real nice. She had a, a sexy perfume, you know, the kind that drive most guys a little crazy. Um, but like I told you before, she had dark shades and a scarf on, so I really didn't see her face too clearly. Your Honor, I recall Laura Rand. Ms. Rand, you were a guest at the Hotel Sinclair the night of the murder? No. Have you ever visited? The Hotel Sinclair. No, never. Have you ever visited Mr. Hartman's hunting supply store? No, never. Your Honor, I fail to see the point of any of this line of questioning. This is all baseless, and Mr. Mason is wasting the court's time. Your Honor, once again, I reserve the right to recall Ms. Rand and now call Police Lieutenant Brock. Lieutenant Brock. You are and have been stipulated to be a recognized expert in criminalistics, are you not? That is correct. Did you recently have the opportunity to examine the desk register and room 1502 at the Hotel Sinclair? Yes, at your request, I examined both of those areas for fingerprints. Did you also check and examine the front counter area of Hartman's hunting supply store for fingerprints? Yes, I did, Mr. Mason. Were you able to locate and identify any legible prints? As you can imagine, there were quite a few full and partial prints which were discovered. Of these, we took only the clear, full prints and matched them with our known exemplars. Were you able to identify those prints, Lieutenant? The matched prints belonged to Laura Rand. Now I ask you, on the night of March 19th, did you not go to your fiancé's penthouse and murder him, knowing Roxanne Shields would be blamed? No. I loved Ted. Why would I kill him? Mr. Melansky, a 
According to the sworn testimony Marie Danton gave in this courtroom, she had an affair with Ted Maine, not in June of 1990, as he contended in his book, but in June of 1991, while he was engaged to you. He lied to you, didn't he? You became jealous, insanely jealous. How many other women had he lied about? How many? A statue identical to the one you'd given Ted Maine was found 10 feet from his body, broken into hundreds of pieces. Now, how did that happen, Ms. Rand? I don't know. I wasn't there. We show you a blow-up from page 94 of Maine's book. It's a picture of Ted and Marie Danton. Now, if you look closely, you can see the statue you gave him in the background. It's not in any other picture, just that one. You certainly realized the significance of that, did you not? Ted Maine had had an affair after he met you, maybe several. That made you insanely jealous, did it not? Roxanne Shields' statement on television gave you the perfect person to frame. You were insanely jealous of her too, were you not? So. He went to his penthouse that night, disguised as Roxanne Shields. You stabbed him to death, and you smashed the statue. The present you'd given him, you smashed it to bits. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it, Ms. Rand? The loving present you'd given him is one of the things that trapped you. Mr. Mason. Do you want to know what is really ironic? Ted's ego. If he hadn't included Marie Datton in that book, <laughs> I never would have known. Oh, but he just had to include her pictures in the book. Just couldn't resist flaunting one last conquest. I think men get what they deserve. Don't you? Move to dismiss, Your Honor. Defense certainly concurs. Motion is granted. Bailiff is instructed to take this witness into custody. This court is adjourned. Isn't he wonderful? I think so. Harry? So, I... what about that charity dinner? You just named the day, and I am there. Thank you so much. Oh. Thank you, Della. Oh, good luck, dear. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Oh. Hold up, hold up. Where, where, where are you going? That is one murderer I happen to be on a first name basis with any luck, and I'm going to get an exclusive. Well, I thought maybe we could have lunch. Are you kidding? Dinner. Meet me at the station at 6.30. I'm not waiting till 6.30. What's this? Present. For whom? For you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Put it away. We'll take a trip to where those grew up. Oh. Got it. How did you know? Who's the greatest detective in the world? Sherlock Holmes. That 
happy birthday. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Inside Copy. Television's high-rated sitcom Josie is once again grabbing headlines due to the off-screen antics of its volatile star, Josie Joplin. This time, the explosive star is rumored to be divorcing her husband and co-star, Toby Joplin. Even though their popular show extols family values, their real-life marriage is Battle of the Stars. So far, Josie and Toby have refused to confirm or deny the rumors. But here at Inside Copy, we don't take no comment for an answer. We take you now to Kendall Moss Studios, where Josie Joplin is arriving now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We are here today at Kendall Moss Studios, home of the popular sitcom Josie. And I believe that's her now. Any truth in the rumor that you and your husband are breaking up? Is there trouble with your marriage? Toby! Toby! Josie Joplin down the hall. Toby Joplin, you sneaky slime ball. Hey, Josie. Hey, you can't come in here. Your girlfriend, huh? You liar. What's she? Are you sleeping with my husband? Get the girl. Get the girl. No, hey, leave me alone. This is all a mistake. Toby's just giving me notes for next week's script. That better be all he's giving you, honey, or you're dead. Now, what are you doing in here? You know you're not supposed to be out of here. Go on, go away. Well, it looks like Josie Joplin has won this round, but if we know her, the fight is far from over. My client's offering you half a million, Mackenzie. It's a lot of money, Miss Pullman. Well, he's in a lot of trouble. Of course, the evidence against him is all circumstantial, but you never know which way a jury's gonna go. Well, in my experience, most juries go for the truth. Sure, if it's presented properly. But you've seen the headlines. Mega-rich software tycoon indicted for murder of business rival. Mega-rich. You see the bias. Juries hate rich people. Ah, uh, you should have watched your step. Those were nice shoes. You can convince the jury he didn't do it. Make him see the man behind the money. Talk about his charity work. All he's done for the poor and the rich. Exactly. I've seen you in court, Mackenzie. Nobody works a jury like you. Mackenzie. Oh, Iris, hello. I'm afraid I can't talk now. I'll call you back in 10 minutes. Thanks. You think I manipulate juries? In the most positive way. You're the best. You know the figure I quoted? Between us, I think you'll go higher. There's only one problem with your proposition, Counselor. What's that? Your client's guilty. I don't understand. Don't expect you to. Have a safe trip back to New York, Mr. Pullman. Too bad about your shoes. Iris Bill, what about... Slow down. What about Ivy? The what? What channel? You sneaky slime ball. Hey, Joe. All of them. Hey, you can't come in no here. girlfriend, huh? You liar. What's she? Are you sleeping with my husband? Get the girl. No, get the girl. Of course I'm not. No, uh, hey, leave me alone. This is all a mistake. Toby, you just give me the next week's script. That better what go. in the name of blue snakes you got yourselves What into? are you doing in here? You know you're not supposed to be out of here. Go on. Go away. Uh, yes, uh, Iris, I saw it. Now, darling, stop crying. Uh, don't worry, Iris. I'll go down there and bring her home. There's something else, like the tickets. <laughs> oh, I think that's everything. Huh? We're all set. Bella? Hi. Hi. Bill McKenzie. Bella, good to see you again. Hi. Are you flying the coop again? Well, I, I'm joining Perry at the Hague in Netherlands. He's arguing a case in the World Court. The World Court? Boy, am I impressed. Mm -hmm. He can't do it without you, though, can he? So he says. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excuse me, yeah. Janice. This is Bill McKenzie. Janice, my assistant. You remember? Oh, yeah. We talked on the phone. Nice to see you. You know, uh... You don't ever leave the ranch without there being a reason. 
there wouldn't be a problem now, would there? Well, it's my niece Ivy, a uh, mm. wonderful girl. I mm. helped my sister raise her when her yeah. daddy died. Yeah. Well, she got herself mixed up with some woman on television, Josie yeah. Joplin. Oh, your your niece is the Ivy West, who's having the with uh, Toby Joplin. Well, we don't know that for a fact, but uh, can't raise her on the phone, so I'm going over to the studio yes. and track her down. That show tapes this afternoon. Uh, I, I have a friend who's in the production company there. I'll, I'll ring up and I'll get you a ticket. Oh, good going, Janice. That Janice. You see, she'll be there any time you need her, Bill. And and Ken, he'll be here in the morning. Oh. I'm just sorry I can't help you, Bill. Oh, it's lovely to see you. I'm so late. Okay. I'm really late. Well, let me help you. Oh, here's, here's your coat. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Bella, mm -hmm. next time I'm in town, will you have dinner with me? It's a date. Safe trip. Bye, Bill. Ivy? Ivy? Uncle Bill! Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, uh, it's the only way I could get to you. You're not answering your phone. Oh, it's been really hectic. The show's in production. I I'm hardly ever home. After what I saw on the TV, I thought you might want to go home. Home? <gasps> you mean home? Well, yeah. Your mother thought you might want to finish college. That sounds like Mom. Uncle Bill, do you know how many college graduates come to L.A. hoping to land a job as a production assistant on a television show? No, I have laid awake nights on that. Thousands. But I got the job. I am not going home. You don't care what the TV and newspapers are saying about you. You mean the tabloids? You didn't take that seriously, did you? Are you involved with this married man? No. And if you don't believe me, you can ask him. Come on. I'll introduce you. Toby? I forgot. He's in makeup. I'll get him. You mind waiting here? No, no, I'm I'm okay. <laughs> no, I'll have some uh, candy. <laughs> oh. Hello, cowboy. Who are you? Uh, I'm Bill McKenzie. I'm Ivy West's uncle. Oh, yeah. Uh, from Omaha, right? Utah. 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 I flew over Utah once. There was nothing there. Excuse me. Hello? What? No. I said absolutely not. Look, you just tell your boss at the network that I ain't presenting no Emmy to nobody unless I'm grabbing one of those suckers for myself. You got it? Thanks. You're so lucky you're from Utah, cowboy. You don't have to put up with all this crap. Oh, I'd rather fight a circle saw. They're eating me alive. I gotta get out. Why don't you? <laughs> yeah, I suppose I could go back to that... that crummy truck stop pouring coffee with all those big apes pinching my butt. You out of your mind? Not when I came in here. I can't get out. See, I'm a comic. It's the only thing I know how to do. Do you know that I played every crummy joint on the stand-up circuit in order to get where I am now? But see, this was supposed to be the big jackpot. All this was supposed to make me happy. Got what you prayed for. Yeah, but it, it wouldn't be so bad, really, if, if I just didn't have to look out for my butt every minute. You know something, cowboy? People will get you if you let them. My daddy taught me that with the back of his hand. You might have heard me talk about that on Oprah. Missed that. Oh. Well, you know, they have reruns, so maybe if you could catch that one, then you'd know what I'm about. I think um, the only person eating you alive is you. Uncle Bill McKenzie, Toby Joplin. Toby's co-star and producer of the show. He's the boss. Well, I am when Josie lets me be. <laughs> Mr. Joplin? Oh, just call me Mr. Josie, Bill. Everybody else does. My uncle's worried I might be in trouble with you. Oh, Bill, my intentions are entirely honorable. Actually, I'd marry the girl if my wife didn't take such a dim view of that whole harem thing. 
women can be so jealous. Mostly when they have good reason, is my experience. Uh, our mistress calls. Seriously, Bill, Ivy's the best production assistant I've ever had, and that's as far as it goes. You have my word. So the stories are all lies. Never believe what you read in the tabloids. That's my motto. Toby, we got problems. Will you stop all the yapping and get your ugly butt back here? I gotta go. Excuse Enjoy the show, me. okay? Excuse me, Toby. What is this, huh? You're supposed to be making Josie happy. She's meaner than ever. Who's a man with Mr. Joplin? Then Landry, Josie's manager. She keeps him dancing. He likes doing that? Sure. She's a star. Well, Uncle Bill, are you satisfied that I'm not in trouble? I'm satisfied you're doing what you want to. And I'm happy. Tell Mom I'm happy. That's important. Hey, would you like to watch the show from the wings? Sure. That'd be fun. taping before okay so you know the whole deal try not to nod off on me okay for the rest of you a sitcom taping is a lot like watching a tv show at home but there's a couple differences on the plus side there's no commercials Yay! and on the minus side it takes about twice as long and there's no zapping channels to catch the latest celebrity trial updates on court tv uh, uh, hey oh one more minute left to showtime. Would you like to meet the stars of our show? Yeah! Yeah! Ladies and gentlemen, the lovely young lady playing our teenage daughter, Regina Hooverman, Claire Howard! And as Regina's truck driver dad, the bumbling Bert Hooverman, our co-star, co-creator, co-producer, co-spouse of the year, not to mention Davenport, Iowa's favorite son, Toby Joplin! <laughs> and finally, the lady who knew me when, the woman who put the blue back in the blue collar, the one and only star of our show, because without her there would be no show, ladies and gentlemen, Josie Joplin! <laughs> We just love you so much, and I'm telling you, this show is going to be better than you even know. Lots of surprises, lots of good things. I want you to clap real loud, have a good time. Let's have a good show! Bert, tell Gina she's not going to date Ricky Denninger. You're not going to date Rick Denninger? Why isn't she going to date Rick Denninger? Because I dated his dad. And he thought no meant, come on, come on, try a little harder. <laughs> well, just because that happened to me doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. Oh, cut. You're an idiot. The line is, just because it happened to you doesn't mean it's going to happen to me. It's all that peroxide, you know, that blonde stuff that's eating up your brain. You're really obnoxious, you know that? What did you say to me? Come on, Josie, don't get upset, huh? What do you mean, don't get upset? Wait a minute, are you siding with her against me? Are you sleeping with her, too? Hey, Bimbo, I thought I fired you. Josie, there are people watching. Hey, get Please. Out of my we don't want to talk to you. You're such a loser. Do you know that? You're sleeping with all these women and siding with them against me. Josie. Your wife, don't you know that I know, honey? How could... Do you think that I'm stupid? I want you to know something. I am not stupid. No, you're not stupid. You're just crazy. <laughs> Josie! You just all go to hell, okay? Especially you. Yeah? Over your dead body. <laughs> Promised you some surprises. <laughs> it's gonna get even better tomorrow. Can I hear it? Listen, about what happened in there, I... 
That was quite a performance. How did you know? Well, I saw Josie Joplin give the high sign to that girl's photographer. Publicity. It was Josie's idea. What about you, Ivy? Why do you go along with this? Every time Josie does something outrageous, the ratings go up. That's good for me, too. I didn't expect her to slap me. That was just rotten. Here's a little lower than that, darling. She doesn't seem to care what folks think about you. You mean Mom? Tell her it's just showbiz. Tell her that I'm... Ivy! Oh. <laughs> I gotta go. Oh, it's so good to see you, Uncle Bill. Ah. Tell Mom I'll call. You do that. Our mistress calls. awful fire. They were screaming, furniture crashing. I called you right away. Mrs. Joplin, are you all right? Mrs. Joplin. Open it. Police, freeze. situation comedy, Josie. thought you did. How's mom holding up? She's worried. I've embarrassed her and you. 
Now, stop it, Ivy. Beating up on yourself won't help. Now, come on. Tell me what happened last night. Um, I was working in the production office. <laughs> and I got a page from Josie. Calling from where? The hotel. She moved into the hotel because, um, she wanted the press to think that she'd walked off the show and disappeared. You know, more publicity. Mm -hmm. So her hotel phone number was on the pager? No. It was one of those pagers where you phone into a central service and, and then they send you a typed message on the pager screen. Yeah, well, how do you know it was, uh, the call was from Josie? The message said, get your butt over here. Oh. Yeah. Vintage Josie. Mm -hmm. So I got my butt over there. Did you tell anyone you were going over to Josie's hotel? No. Outside the, um, <clears throat> the cleaning crew, I was the only one in the office. Why'd you sneak into the hotel by the back stairs? Because Josie wanted... She didn't want anyone from the show seen at the hotel. Oh. I see. So you kept out of sight. See ya. The door to her room was open. It was dark inside. And somebody knocked me down. You get a look at him? Nope. It was too dark. Everything just happened so fast. <laughs> Did anything else happen last night? At the studio or, or your home? Anything unusual? No. Or the jerk in the Jeep. What Jeep? What? This guy almost ran me down in the studio parking lot. Had you seen him before? Never. And I know everyone that works at the studio. Now, this guy was in a really big hurry. Mm -hmm. I remember his, his license plate because it had odd number. It looked like it was a vanity plate, but it wasn't. You know, it was some um, 777 something. Yeah, 777. All right, now, just one last question, and this is important. Besides you, who else knew that Josie would moved over to that hotel last night? Toby, Claire, Ben Landry, Lisa. That's all. One of them could have framed you for murder. Your client and the deceased were in a public no fight idea. just one week before the murder. An audience of over 200 people heard your client threaten Josie Chaplin. Oh, that was a publicity stunt, Lieutenant. It might have started out as a publicity stunt, and then it got serious. Josie Joplin threatened to fire your client. Your client knew she was going to do it and came here planning a murder. Uh, my client came here because Josie Joplin paged her. Wrong. We checked the hotel's computerized billing systems. No calls came into this room last night. No calls went out of this room last night. Know what I think, Counselor? What do you think, Lieutenant? I think your client called that paging service herself, and that obviously would give her an alibi. Well, you're entitled to your opinion, but I I'm partial to the facts myself. All right. Let's check the facts. Fact. The desk clerk phoned 911 to report hearing a violent struggle in Josie Joplin's hotel suite. Fact. That call was clocked in at 11.40 p.m., Fact. A patrol car arrived on the scene at 11.51. Fact. They entered the room at 11.54. Fact. You know what they found, Counselor? Not till you tell me. The deceased. Your client crouched over the deceased with the murder weapon in her hand. Fact. What about the 14 minutes between the time the desk clerk called 911 and the police arrived? What do you think my client was doing all that time? Waiting around to be caught or catching butterflies? Ask her. Doesn't it strike you maybe my client was set up? That's an interesting theory, Counselor, but personally I prefer the facts. And the facts tell me we have this one nailed. Murder one, open and shut. Mm -hmm. The partial license plate Ivy gave you? DMV lists over 200 plates starting with the number 777, but only one is a Jeep in the Los Angeles area. Did you get a name and address? Yeah, Martin Kester, DMV, has him in an apartment out on Morrison Avenue in the Valley. Thought I'd drive out and meet him. Watch yourself. You might ask him what he was doing at the studio that night and why he was in such a hurry he darn near ran over Ivy. Uh, well, let's uh, see where we stand. Ken? 
Okay, according to Ivy, only four other people knew where Josie was that night. That'd be Toby Joplin, Ben Landry, Claire Howard, and Lisa Kay, that's all. Her husband, her business manager, her co-star, and her best friend, they all knew where she was. Which means that any one of them had the means and the opportunity to plan and execute her murder. But did any of them have a motive? We need to know more about these folks, Janice. That isn't going to be hard, Mr. McKenzie. The people around Josie had their lives all over the tabloids. I know more about them than I do my own family. You read the tabloids? Ah, uh, no. No, I don't read them. I, they, they're there at the checkout counter. No, you can't help but glance at the headlines. How else would we know where Elvis is appearing? with my jeep relax relax are you martin kester who's asking my name's ken Milansky. i was wondering what you were doing outside the candlemas studios the other night oh sure i Pardon, miss. My name's McKenzie, and I'm looking for Toby Joplin. Oh, sure. He's expecting you. Just a second. I'll walk you down. i got to drop these on Lisa's desk. Oh, thank you. Uh, Lisa. Would that be uh, Lisa Kay, the comedian? Mm-hmm. She does the audience warm-up for the show. Oh, 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 all right. Yes. You I'm okay? fine. Huh? I'm fine. Yes. Oh, I don't know what Rich. happens to me. Ooh. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> the floor is slippery. They waxed it last night. I guess they did. You don't want to lose these now, huh? Thank you. Um, Toby should be back any minute. You can wait in his office. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Are you sure you're all right? Yes, I'm okay. fine. Thank you. First thing in the morning. Bill! Hi. Uh, you know Claire? No, I haven't had the pleasure. Uh, I'm Bill McKenzie, Miss Howard. Hi. I saw you on the news leaving the hotel where Josie died. You're Ivy's attorney. That I am. Well, you photograph great. Too bad Ivy's guilty. Thanks again, and I will have Bob call you. Terrific. Gee, uh, I've been thinking a lot about Ivy Bill. Arrested for murder? That must be awful. Girl's tougher than she looks. I'd like to ask you a few questions. Now's a good time. Let's go for a walk. The network wants us to stay in production. We'll change the name. Call it Josie's Family. Introduce a new character, Josie's mean old Aunt Maggie. This must be a very difficult time for you. Oh, it's been brutal. Hey, Sally. Looking good. 
I understand you and your wife had a colorful relationship. Oh, I had the bruises to prove it. Yeah, she claimed you came after her with a baseball bat. Now, is that really true? That's a lie. It was a tire iron, and she hit me. The woman had a temper like a volcano. Why'd you stay with her? Josie almost killed me, but she never bored me. I loved her. Is it true that she made you sign a prenuptial agreement? So if you divorced her, you'd uh, be left without a cent? Now, who told you that? Who sold me out? Well, you talked about it on uh, Oprah. Who knew anyone was listening? <laughs> Luckily for me, Josie and I were happily married. According to an interview in the National Informer the day she died, said she was uh, divorcing you. Oh, that's a lie. They made it up. Josie were here, she'd tell them. Just what is the truth here, Mr. Joplin? Uh, just one more uh, question, Mr. Joplin. Where were you when your wife was being murdered, sir? I was right here in my office. Anybody see you? No. But what about Ivy? I mean, she and Josie hated each other. Uh, story's right here. Read it. All right, you read this. Oh, what's this, another interview? I'm gonna have to see you in court. Hi, Patricia McDonald, Ken Malansky. Mind if I come on in? Excuse me, am I supposed to know you? You ought to. You took my picture outside Martin Kester's apartment building just before you almost ran me down. You're a photographer. How did you find me? Well, I got your license plate number as you drove away. You're good. The DMV says your name's Patricia McDonald. You work for the National Informer. Are you checking me out because you like me? Or is snooping your hobby? You tell me, you're the reporter. What were you doing outside Martin Kester's apartment building? I don't have to tell you anything. <laughs> you know, cameras have always fascinated me. Now let's see, where do we put the film in? Ah, here I see. Let's look at it this way. You owe me what's on this film. Okay, look. I'm covering the Josie Joplin case. I followed you from Perry Mason's office. You're working for Bill McKenzie. You were my best lead. What can you tell me about Kester? You mean the guy in the Jeep? Nothing. What's his story anyway? How's he connected to the case? Who says he's connected? Right. Like you'd be doing all this if he wasn't. And what am I doing? Tracking me down, asking me if I know the guy. You don't know where he is, and you need to find him, right? <laughs> right. Maybe I can help. How? Uh, Do I get an inside crack at the story from you? You tell me where to find Kester, and we'll talk about it. Give me my film. Why? Well, that's how we find Kester. After you. <clears throat> Hollywood agents, don't get me started. You know why a lot of medical labs across the country are using agents instead of rats in their experiments? They found the students don't get as attached to agents. Who's there? Bill McKenzie, go ahead, I'm enjoying your monologue. <sighs> Speaking of animals, I just found out what you get when you cross a lawyer and a snake. 
You get an agent who can shed his skin. <laughs> I hear you chuckling. Are you sure you're an attorney? Oh, yeah. 40 years now. Just getting the hang of it. Where'd you learn about lighting? Well, I used to work backstage when my wife was an amateur actress. She was good, too. A lot of folks said she ought to make a career of it. But she, uh... Said she didn't want to leave the ranch. Didn't want to leave me. <laughs> said she was content. I hope so. God knows I was contented with her. You enjoy working on your material. The truth, doing stand-up terrifies me. Is that why you haven't played clubs since you and Josie Joplin split up? Josie and I were a team. When she went off to do her sitcom, I couldn't get any solo bookings. Well, gosh, I find that hard to believe. I read a lot of reviews of your act together. A lot of critics thought you were funnier than she was. <clears throat> Am I supposed to be flattered? So, instead of striking off on your own, you uh, took a job warming up Josie's audience. Why would you do that? Well, maybe I was afraid of performing without Josie. Maybe she was afraid of you, the competition. Wanted you in her shadow. No, she couldn't force me to do that. A couple of years ago, you two had a real knockdown fight. Josie withdrew uh, felony assault charges, but only after you signed a long-term contract with her production company, right? So you're saying she blackmailed me? I'm saying she cut you a deal. <laughs> no, you're wrong. Josie dropped the charges because we're old friends. Well, your old friend wouldn't release you from your contract a couple of weeks ago when you were offered a Showtime comedy special. Or six months ago when uh, another network wanted you for your own sitcom. Or a year ago when you were offered a job in a movie. She had you boxed in, Miss Kay. Didn't she? <laughs> Josie and I would have worked it out. Not according to your agent. He said she was killing off your career. Now I know I hate agents. Can you tell me where you were the night Josie died? Yeah, I was in the production office working on material for my warm-up routine. Did anyone see you? No, but I've got it on tape. Want to hear it? Sure. Gentiles and ladies, men. Oh, <laughs> sorry I'm late, but I ran into my agent on the way over here. Unfortunately, he survived. <laughs> anyway, I got hassled by a panhandler on the way in. Well, why don't you hang on to that? Maybe we'll play it in court. <laughs> Not my best side. I didn't know lawyers had a best side, Milansky. Go ahead, sweet talk me. I can take it. Oh. oh, careful. Try not to bump into anything. Some of that stuff for slide processing can be flammable. Thought it was getting kind of hot in here. You seem to know what you're doing, so why are you wasting all that talent on the National Informer? The Informer is a good paper. Oh, yeah. Space aliens advising Bill and Hillary. Four-year-old girls giving birth. That's real Pulitzer stuff. Well, we all got to do what we got to do till we get what we want. And this is just the beginning. One of yours? No. Well, all the excitement was happening. I was taking pictures at a rock club. It's the next page. Check it out. Just my dumb luck. When the story hit, I was halfway across town. Which is why I need a hot lead from you, Lomansky. Bingo. So Kester's in Masseur at the Beverly Hills Health Spa. I'll check it out. Great. I'll come with you. I said I might give you a story. Hey, fair is fair. I never said that you could tag along in my investigation. Really? That's great. Wait a minute. I have something that might change your mind. There's another picture you ought to see. Come here.
I didn't just fall for that, did I? I did. Patricia! I noticed Kester go into the building. And by the time I got here, he'd already started the fire. Oh, yeah. I know, partner. <coughs> oh, we're talking total multimedia, gentlemen. You get the entertainment software you need for your electronics hardware. We get a new outlet for our product. Everybody's happy. We must be clear. You personally control all rights to this material. 16 hours, gentlemen. 16 hours of Josie Joplin concert tapes previously unseen and unedited. Perfect for video and CD and yours for a seven-figure song. What do you think? Gentlemen, um, would you excuse me for just a minute? Uh, Irene, get the boys whatever they want. Well... Mr. McKenzie, this is a surprise. Well, I see you're busy. Uh, I just yes. need a few moments of your oh. time. I could wait. Uh, well, yes, I am in a meeting. Could you make it fast? Oh, I'll make it uh, yes. right to it. Uh, now, you were Josie Joplin's business manager. Yes, I was. Yes, poor Josie. Well, she was my favorite client. Oh, she was your only client. Uh, well, she... <laughs> when you're handling as someone as big as Josie Joplin who needs other clients, right? No, I mean, uh, once she became a star, she made you drop all your other clients. No, that's no, that, no, that's just wrong. Now, you're making things up here, Mr. Oh, no. McKenzie. No, I don't make things up, Mr. Landry. Sure. Josie needed full-time handling, yes. But you see, she made so much money for the company, I was happy to do it. We owned her production company together. Did you know that? Now, get out of here. Josie Joplin was ending your partnership. You're lying, Mr. Landry. No, I, uh, two days before her murder, she filed papers cutting you out of her production company. She was firing you. Ah, uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, I'll be right with you. Irene, get them whatever they want. What does that lawsuit have to do with anything? Well, if Josie's dead, then so's her lawsuit, huh? I mean, that leaves you in control of her company. Now, that is a, that's a pretty good reason for wanting your client dead. Obviously, you don't understand the business, Mr. McKenzie. Could be. Enlighten me. To put it in terms that you would understand, Josie was the cow. 
And without the cow, there's no milk, now is there? So even if I keep my share of the company, how do I profit now that she's dead? Well, counting domestic syndication and cable rights to her show, uh, foreign sales to multiple markets, not to mention exploitation of ancillary rights and interactive and multimedia, I'd say that you're looking at potential annual revenue stream in the $100 million range for the rest of this decade. Your cow is going to be given milk for some time, Mr. Landry, dead or not. I didn't kill her. Uh, and you won't mind telling me where you were while Josie was being murdered. I was at the studio. I was in her office on a conference call with investors. I was on from uh, 11.30 to almost 11.45. You can check with my people back there and they will tell you. I'll do that. Have a nice day, gentlemen. I'll see you in court. Mm -hmm. There he is. That is Kessler. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Kester got away. Yeah, so did she. I hate dead ends. Come on. Excuse me. Please. Ms. Howard would like to tell all her fans that she's heartened by their love and support in this time of tragedy. Will Claire stay or leave the show? Well, she'll stay through the end of this season. As for next season, it'll depend entirely on her feature film career. Has Claire had any offers? Several. All for starring roles in a number of upcoming films. Uh, are those the same film roles that Josie Joplin wouldn't let you take a couple of weeks back, Miss Howard? Uh, I'm sorry. Who are you? Uh, Bill McKenzie. I've been trying to reach Miss Howard. She keeps ducking my calls. Is it true that Josie Joplin tried to sidetrack your movie career? I'm sorry. Uh, Miss Howard has to get back to the set. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any other questions you might have. What does Claire know about Josie's murder? Oh, well, that's something for the district attorney's office to handle. Who's the guy with Claire? Are they going to get married? <laughs> You'll have to ask her. You're a hard lady to talk to. Why is that? You stay away from her. Do you want her to answer my questions here or in court in front of the TV cameras? What is it that you want to know? I just need to clear up a few things. Now, you had an exclusive contract with Josie Joplin's production company, am I right? Everyone knows that. And she had the right to veto any movie roles you might be offered. If she felt it would harm the show's family reputation, yeah. It's a standard clause in a lot of show contracts. Yeah, I know, but didn't she use that clause to keep you from taking any movie jobs yeah. at all? It didn't bother me, Mr. McKenzie. I mean, after all, even the most successful TV show ends. I knew I'd have other opportunities. I'm young. Well, not as young as you want folks to think. What is that supposed to mean? Well, forgive me, Miss Howard, but uh, your publicity says you're 22. That's about 10 years off the truth, isn't it? Tabloid gossip, Mr. McKenzie. Not if Josie told him you were born 32 years ago in Wahoo, Nebraska. We've located your birth certificate, Miss Howard, the real one. You're 32? For God's sake, Steve, shut up. 
So I play younger than my age, so what? But how long could you go on doing that? She was robbing you of a movie career, wasn't she? What does she have against you? Not a thing. Josie didn't need a reason to be mean. Boy, how you must have hated her for that and wanted her out of the way. Right. Look at me. I couldn't beat Josie in a cat fight. Never mind, kill her. I'm not strong enough. Oh, maybe not, but he is. Hey, a couple of minutes ago, you were mighty eager to defend your lady. Back off. A man who's quick to anger usually feels he's got something to prove. Get out of my way. Steve. Uh, what do you got to prove, huh? You don't have a name, do you? I'm warning you. Steve. Maybe you don't need a name. Maybe it's enough to be Claire Howard's boyfriend. Steve! Boy, he's got a temper. Smart girl like you might find that temper useful. Where were you when Josie was being killed, Mr. Boyfriend? He was with me in my dressing room at the studio. The guards saw us. Ask him. I'll do that. I'll see you both in court early tomorrow morning. Miss Mitchell, as night clerk at the Belmont Hotel on the evening of Josie Joplin's death, did something unusual occur which caused you to summon police to the hotel? Yes, sir. Please tell the court what happened the night of the murder at approximately 11.40 p.m. Well, I heard sounds of a struggle, a violent struggle in Miss Joplin's room. I immediately called 911. The police arrived 10, yeah, about 10 minutes later. We all went upstairs. We knocked on Miss Joplin's door, but there was no answer. Did you enter Miss Joplin's room with the police at that time? Yes, sir, I did. And what did you see? I saw her. Indicating the defendant, Ivy West, Your Honor. Her clothes were all messed up. Her sleeves were torn. She was bending over Miss Joplin's body. Thank you, Miss Michener. Your witness, Counselor. Miss Michener, um... Now, you call the police at 11.40, and uh, you entered the uh, Mrs. Joplin's hotel suite at 11.54, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Now, during those 14 minutes, did you see anyone enter or leave Miss Joplin's hotel suite? Oh, no. There was no one. Where were you? Me? Yeah. I was outside, waiting for the police. So... Anyone could have entered or left the hotel suite during those 14 minutes. You were outside waiting for the police, and uh, you wouldn't have seen them, would you? No, sir. <laughs> That's what I thought. Uh, I have no further questions. The people call Lieutenant Ed Brock. I am showing you People's Exhibit 7, which has already been identified as the murder weapon. Can you tell us if any fingerprints were discovered on this lamp by the forensic team? We found several prints on the lamp, all belonging to the defendant, Ivy West. Were any other fingerprints found on the murder weapon, Lieutenant? Only Miss West. The people have no further questions, Your Honor. Uh, uh Lieutenant, oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, now, you say the only fingerprints found on this lamp were those belonging to my client? That's what I just testified. Now, how, how do you explain that? I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, uh, in a busy hotel room, people are coming and going all the time, turning lamps off, feeling them and all. How, how, do you, how do you explain the fact there's only one set of fingerprints on this particular lamp? Well, maybe the hotel maid wiped the lamp when she came in to clean the room. Did you ask her if she No, counselor, that? I didn't ask her if yeah, she But did. now, what, what if I tell you? that the hotel maid did not clean the room that day because Mrs. Joplin wouldn't let her in, then that means someone else must have wiped this lamp clean. Uh, probably the real murderer. Objection, Your Honor. Argumentative. Assumes facts not in evidence. Calls for speculation. Withdraw the question and thank this officer for testifying here today. Nothing further. Uh, you may uh, step down, Lieutenant. Thank you. We're doing fine. Where's Ken? I called in earlier. He's tracking down a lead. I hope he got a good one. Call its next witness. Will you please tell me what we're doing here? Listen, Milansky, if you want to find Kester, just do as I say. Now, I snatched the appointment sheet off the receptionist's desk. The woman's name is Rosa Westlake. Like I thought, she comes in every day. My source tells me she has a jealous husband. 
She's in there. She's waiting. Waiting for who? You. Oh, this is as far as I go. Good luck. Make it real deep. I'm very tense. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, excuse me. Mrs. Westlake requested another masseur today. Take over 19. Oh, yeah. You must be new here. You have marvelous hands. We're an attorney. Oh. You're an attorney? What, is business that bad? Oh, actually, business is booming. Uh. We have to work on this muscle. You're holding a lot of tension oh. here. Oh. oh, yeah. Your life in the big city. Uh. Oh. Actually, I, I'm working on the Josie Joplin murder case. And I think that you could be a very important witness. We're looking into a Martin Kester. I believe you know him. I don't remember a Martin Kester. Well, let me give you a hint. He gave you a gold necklace. Oh, God. Just don't tell Sydney. It's your choice. Tell me about it here, where I can hear your side of the story. Or if you'd rather, Bill McKenzie can take you apart in court. In court? Or here. Request permission to examine Mr. Joplin as an adverse witness, Your Honor. Uh, within reason, Mr. Wells. Mr. Joplin, on more than one occasion, your wife accused you and the defendant of having a love affair, didn't she? <laughs> Actually, uh, yes. Uh, once she did, yes. And there was truth to that accusation, wasn't there? Well, could you define truth? Your Just Honor. answer the question, Mr. Job. The question, uh, were we having an affair? Uh, you mean me and Ivy, Ivy West? Okay. All right. We'd been seeing each other. The truth is that you and Ivy West have been intimate for months. Well, by intimate, do you mean uh, a drink after work or an early bird dinner or... Uh... Mr. Joplin, you are under oath. Okay. Okay. We were intimate. So, your... Your wife's jealous rage wasn't a publicity stunt. Oh, she was madder than hell. And your wife had a reputation for, um... Shall we say, getting back at people who made her madder than hell, didn't she? Oh, sure. Well, everybody knew that Josie liked squashing people. Not that she wasn't sweet. She loved animals. Why, well, you show Josie a stray dog or a cat and she'd just... Thank you, Mr. Joplin. No further questions. Mr. McKenzie? Uh, no questions at this time, Your Honor, but defense reserves the right to recall this witness at a later time. Noted the witness may step down. The people rest, Your Honor. Oh, he's lying. You know he's lying. Uh, he's good at it, too. Tosses him off like he believes in himself. We'll get him. Mr. McKenzie, is the uh, defense ready to call its first witness? We are, Your Honor. Uh, defense calls Lisa Kay. Mr. McKenzie, this is Ken. Good. I'll be right back. Janice? Janice? I'm losing you. It's a connection. I'm going to call you back. Yeah, hey, try mine. It gets great reception. Thanks. Is this any better? Tell Bill that we're up the road from 1300 Malibu Ridge. It's a mountain house. Yeah, Kester's there. We'll just keep an eye on him until we hear back from Bill. Thanks, Janice. What's our friend up to now? I don't know. He was in there a few minutes ago, but I can't see him now. Try looking over here. Come on. Gentiles and ladies, men. 
Uh, sorry I'm late, but I ran into my agent on the way over here. Unfortunately, he survived. <laughs> anyway, I got hassled by a panhandler on the way in. Now, you say, uh, that while Josie Joplin was being murdered at the Belmont Hotel, you were in the production office at the studio making this recording of your warm-up routine. That's right. Now, on the part of the tape we just heard, the sound is very clear. Is the whole tape that clear? Yes, it is. Well, that's, that's odd. You see, the morning after the murder, I was at the studio being escorted down the hall by a secretary who slipped right outside the production office door. I had to catch her because the floor had just been waxed the night before. Your Honor, what's the point of this? Your Honor, there's a 14-minute gap between the time the police were called about this murder and the time my client was discovered in Mrs. Joplin's hotel suite. Now, I believe the real murderer used those 14 minutes to frame my client, and I want to establish that there were several other people who had both the motive and the opportunity to do so. I'll, uh, I'll permit this line of testimony within reason. Now, you can go ahead, Mr. Well, Ryan. thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, uh, Mr. Ryan of the studio cleanup crew is in this court. Mr. Ryan is prepared to testify that on the night of the murder, his cleanup crew waxed the hallway outside the production office door from 11 p.m. until just past midnight with an industrial waxing machine. They make an awful racket. You could never have recorded anything on this tape without picking up that sound. So, if you weren't at the studio making this recording while Josie Joplin was being killed, what were you doing, Miss Kay? Now, we've established that Josie Joplin's lawsuit would have cost you everything you had, Mr. Landry, and yet you say that while she was being murdered, you were on a conference call to investors? From 11.30 to 11.45 p.m., that's right. Now, you made that call from Josie's office at the studio. Yes, I did. From a studio phone. N no, n not exactly. Oh, you made that call from a cellular phone, didn't you? And uh, the call lasted from 11.25 to 11.31, not 11.45. So you could have made that call from anywhere, even from your car on the way to Ms. Joplin's hotel, so you don't really have an alibi for the time of the murder, do you, Mr. Landry? Steve and I were in my dressing room. A studio guard saw us. Yes, that studio guard is right here in the courtroom, Mr. Serbic. Yes, Mr. Serbic uh, will indeed testify he saw you in a passionate embrace. I told you. But not with your boyfriend, Mr. Gelson. You may sit down, Mr. Serbic. How is that possible? Well, because he saw your boyfriend driving away from the studio a half hour earlier. Now, you may have an alibi for the time of the murder, but Steve Gelson doesn't, which makes me wonder... Why would you perjure yourself for no reason? Do you have a reason? What are you trying to hide? Or whom are you trying to hide? I got people coming after me. I do not like that. What? No, shut up. Shut up. Shut up. You're already in this too deep, pal. Now, you listen to me. Unless you want to see your name in the paper, you better get over here with some cash, and you better do it right now. You got that? You know, Marty, can I call you Marty? The informer has a very generous tips to reimbursement policy. She's going to say anything to get a story. Her paper's never going to pay. Shut up. Why did you say that? He's because, an exclusive. Because if you pay him, it ruins his credibility as a possible defense witness. Oh, right. You think you're going to see him in court? He's holding us prisoner. Think positively, Patricia. Besides, I said potential witness. Now, why don't you help me with these ropes? Uh, how do I do that? Let's see if I can work this rope through that Indian bracelet of yours. I'm 
Let's see if I can sneak up on him. You stay here. Oh, and lose my story? You're nuts. Pardon me, son. I'm a little lost. How far to Malibu Canyon? Bill, that's Kester. He's got a gun. That's all right. So do I. Drop it. All right. What are you doing outside the studio the night Josie Jotham was killed? Did someone hire you to kill her? Hey, look, I didn't kill anybody, all right? All you got to do is ask him. He'll tell you. Who? Ask who? Ask who? Oh. I like your timing, Mackenzie. The girl with the camera still following this story. Yeah, it just keeps getting bigger and better. That's one way to look at it. He might have proved I'd be innocent. Damn. Whoever killed Martin Kester could have killed Josie Job. Boy, oh boy. I give my prize Appaloosa for a new lead. Well. I've always wanted a horse. Try that. You keep it storage. Storage locker key. Where'd you get this? From Martin Kester's gym bag. He left it in his car. You took evidence from the crime scene? Well, no. The car was on the street. It was unlocked. Perfectly legal. Pretty clever, huh? It should have been turned over to the police. I thought you'd be pleased. I'll be pleased when Lieutenant Brock gets this key. Then we'll ask him to find out what's in the storage locker. Well, you do it any way you like. But I am not losing the story. You never quit. Neither do you. Oh, they just made for each other. So were Bonnie and Clyde. Think so? The girl cuts too many corners. Gonna get her into trouble someday. Just hope Ken's not there when it happens. Really Lieutenant, in your investigation into the homicide of Martin Kester, have you been able to find anything out about his lifestyle? Well, we learned that Martin Kester lived way beyond his means. He had an apartment filled with expensive clothes. He also had a vacation house under a false name. Yet his only apparent source of income was his job as a masseur at the Beverly Hills Health Spa. As far as we've been able to determine, Counselor, that is correct. Our Lieutenant, I'm opening People's Exhibit D, a shoebox, which the police removed this morning from Martin Kester's storage locker. Has your lab been able to identify the white powdery substance? The lab identified that as cocaine, Counselor. Thank you, Lieutenant. No further questions from this witness? Your Honor. This witness uh, may be excused. Your Honor, the people fail to see the relevance of this line of testimony. I mean, storage lockers and shoe boxes. Where's this all going? Yeah, the court is equally as curious. Uh, Mr. McKenzie, uh, where are you taking us? I need to ask the court's indulgence, Your Honor. Uh, you have my word. This is all going somewhere. Well, then I suggest you get us to there, and quickly. Defense calls Mrs. Rosa Westlake to the stand. Now, Mrs. Westlake, you understand that you are in a court of law and under oath. Yes. Now, will you tell us, please, what is Martin Kester to you? My monsieur. And what else? My lover who gave you the gold necklace you're now wearing. Yes. He stole it, didn't he? No. But someone else did. Thank you. No more questions, Your Honor. Mr. Joplin, you said you had an affair with Ivy West. That was untrue, wasn't it? Oh, right. Like I sit here in court telling the world I was cheating on my wife if I wasn't. Now, why would I pull a bozo stunt like that? To cover up something you wanted to hide. How much money do you have in your personal bank account? Well, who knows? Ask my accountant. 
The other day while I was waiting for you in your office, your bank statement was laying on a table there. My assistant subpoenaed a copy this morning. I was struck by the size of your balance. Three hundred dollars. I don't need much money. You mean you don't have much money, don't you? When you married Josie Joplin, she made you sign a prenuptial agreement so that all your acting and producing fees went directly into a joint account. And then she put you on a strict allowance. Your own personal bank account never rose much above $1,000, did it? I had all I wanted. I don't think you did. You recognize this necklace? Never saw it before. Oh, look again, Mr. Joplin. Your wife was wearing this necklace in the wedding photo you keep on your desk. That same picture was reprinted on the front page of this newspaper. I thought it looked familiar. Yeah. <laughs> Very unique necklace. Gold choker with a raised diamond design. It was given to Rosa Westlake by Martin Kester. Kester got it from you, didn't he? Well, now. I might give him flowers and candy, but why would I give him my wife's necklace? To pay for an ounce of cocaine. Kester was a drug dealer, and you were his biggest customer, weren't you? Hey, expect a call from my lawyer. That's defamation. Not if it's true. Kester kept a ledger of all his transactions. On the night your wife was murdered, a customer called T.J. traded a gold necklace for an ounce of cocaine. T.J.? Toby Joplin? Were you up at Kester's house yesterday when he was murdered? No. I mean, I didn't kill him. Right now, the police are up there at Kester's house looking for your tire tracks. A lot of T.J.'s in this ledger. 811, a diamond pin. 921, a sapphire bracelet. Emerald earrings, on and on. Did your wife find out you were stealing from her to buy drugs? Did you kill her? When she threatened to divorce you? The tabloids made that up. She loved me. No, oh, I think she loved her television show even more. It was a family show, a sitcom about an American family. Now, Josie knew the show wouldn't be on the air very long if the public found out that its co-star and producer was buying drugs like some back-alley junkie. She had to choose between the show and you, and you lost out, T.J. Well, you tell a good story, Mr. McKenzie, but where's the punchline? If Kester was blackmailing me, threatening to tell Josie, then why would I murder Kester after Josie was already dead? Why, for the same reason your wife was divorcing you, to protect the show. You're now the sole star, the sole executive producer. Kester could have taken all that away from you, and he threatened to do just that, didn't he? Come on, Mr. Joplin. Your tire tracks are up there at Kester's house. It's time to fish or cut bait. All right. Kester would have ruined me. But I didn't kill Josie. The truth just doesn't want to come out of your mouth, does it? Why don't The night you... Josie was murdered, I was with Claire. Claire and I were having an affair. More like a fling. A small fling. But I love Josie. I never would have hurt her. Your Honor. Nothing further. I suggest under the circumstances that the people hold off the cross-examination allow Mr. Joplin to confer with his attorney. This uh, court is recessed until tomorrow. Sorry, Mr. McKenzie. So am I. 
Toby didn't kill Josie, and Claire didn't. That leaves Ben Landry, Lisa Kay. One of them must be the murderer. Yeah, but which one? And how we prove it? It's the hound we're after. I had Chinese food for breakfast. Cold pizza, though. Now that is different. How about popcorn on the side of cold beans? Oh, God, no. So you got the photos? Great. I will have the story ready for you by deadline. Thanks, Jack. I've got the front page locked for tomorrow's edition. Well, if you work for a real paper, you'd have a Pulitzer. You don't get it, do you, Malansky? The National Informer is just my first step. On to bigger and better things, huh? You bet. And you will have to stop by sometime. Help me polish my Pulitzer. Thanks. To the both of you. Mm. See you in court. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. You like Patricia McDonald, don't you, Kenneth? Well, uh, she's smart, but she's tough. She gets what she wants. She goes after someone and she gets them, whatever it takes. She does that. Boy, I can't get it. I just can't take it in. Why would Josie Joplin give Patricia McDonald a story that was untrue and would make her look foolish? You know, for publicity. Say whatever you want about me, just spell my name right. No, but some stars do resent those kinds of stories. Josie Joplin was threatening a lawsuit. Yeah. Toby said the divorce story was a lie. There's something wrong here. A bucket of snakes. What? Ken? Ken, you got some calls to make. Uh, Miss Kay, uh... You told this court that while Josie Joplin was being murdered, you were taping your comedy act. You lied about that, didn't you? Yes, I lied. Will you tell us what you were really doing that night? I was making a telephone call. To Jack at 315-555-7232, am I correct? How did you know that? We subpoenaed your phone log. You made a lot of calls to Jack, didn't you? Jack's an old friend. 315-555-7232 is the phone number of the National Informer. Jack Handley is the editor. You were his source for the stories about Josie Joplin, weren't you? Yes, most of them. Exclusive interview, Josie confirms divorce, blames girl Friday. Did you give Jack the tip for this story? No. That story was a stunt. And when I read it, I called Jack and I warned him that he'd been ripped off. This story in the National Informer was a fraud? Yes. See, Josie was a shark. And once she sunk her teeth into you, she'd never let go. She'd been trying for years to catch the Informer. And that story was a lie. And the writer didn't cross-check it. And Josie was going to nail him. You hated her, didn't you? Yes. And I still hate her, but I didn't kill her. Thank you, Miss Kay. I have no further questions. Your Honor, the people reserve their right to cross-examine this witness later. You may step down. Mr. McKenzie? Defense calls Patricia McDonald to the stand. Miss McDonald, how long have you worked for the National Informer? Uh, six years. You're well paid? Very well paid. So you like working for the National Informer? Big bucks and front page bylines. What's not to like? Then why have you applied for a job at almost every major news organization in the country over the last six years? The Denver Post, Cleveland Plain Dealer, San Francisco Chronicle, Washington Post, New York Times, L.A. Times, on and on. These are copies of your job applications, aren't they? Something wrong with that? 
Well, they turned you down, all of them. Working for the informer has wrecked your credibility as a legitimate journalist, hasn't it? it it's difficult for any reporter to get on those papers. Miss McDonald, what would happen to a writer who caused the National Informer to lose a libel suit costing millions of dollars? The um, writer would be fired. Your byline is on this story. Josie Joplin gave you an exclusive interview in which she told you that she planned to divorce her husband. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Did you cross-check this story? Oh, well, I got it straight from Josie, in her own words. In her own words? Isn't it true that so long as the tabloids don't use direct quotes, they can print all kinds of lies, filth, and trash, and say it comes from, quote, reliable sources, unquote? Well, some tabloids may do that. But a direct quote, in her own words, that opens the door to a libel suit, doesn't it? It can. Knowing that, and knowing Josie Joplin's reputation for having a mean streak, why would you trust her own words? Well, I had no reason not to. Because this wasn't the first story she'd given you, was it? No, it wasn't. She slipped you other stories from time to time, nothing as spectacular as this. And you printed them, didn't you? Yes, I did. And they were all accurate? Yes. She fed you accurate stories so you wouldn't be suspicious when she fed you a lie. She set you up, Miss McDonald. She put your paper on the spot for a 20 or 30 million dollar libel suit for a story she would deny ever giving to you. And that would have meant the end of your high-priced job and your career as even a tabloid reporter. And if you couldn't get a job on the informer at the bottom of the barrel, you'd be finished. You had a motive for murder, didn't you? I was halfway across town when Josie was killed. I was taking pictures at the Roxy. This picture? Yeah, uh, see that clock? It says 1140. And Josie was killed at 1140. Now, how could I be at two different places at the same time? Maybe you can explain something to me. Oh, what's that? The woman in this picture is a movie star, very famous, very married. Well, that's the point, Mr. McKenzie. She's married, and she's dancing with some guy that isn't her husband. That's what makes it a story. I understand that. But why is this married woman wearing her wedding band on her right hand? Now, let me show you the negative. We'll call this Defense Exhibit G for identification. Uh, we acquired this negative under subpoena from the National Informer's Archives. Now, while you're trying to decide whether you want to recognize this negative, let me show you two enlargements of it. We'll call them Defense Exhibit H and I for identification. The married woman is wearing her wedding band on the wrong hand in this enlargement of the newspaper photograph because you flipped the image when you developed it. You reversed it to give yourself an alibi. In this enlargement of the original photograph, the clock does not say 1140. It says 1220. You were at this nightclub after midnight, not before which means you had more than enough time to kill Josie Joplin and get across town. You can't even prove I was at her hotel. Your cellular phone bill shows that you called Ivy West Pager Service at 11.38 and left the message, get your butt over here. Ivy thought that call came from Josie Joplin, but it really came from you. You had only one reason to make that call, Miss McDonald, to frame my client for the murder that you committed. Time for the truth, Patricia. The truth. 
truth. Reporters are supposed to like the truth. It's all I ever wanted to be, a good reporter. I told myself I'd take a job at the Informer for a few years just for the money, and then I'd get a job back in mainstream press. But you can't go back. You can never go back. The Informer was all I had. She was going to take it from me. I begged her not to do it, but she said the trial would be good publicity. She was going to destroy me for publicity. I had to kill her. I had to. She was asking for it, wasn't she? Under the circumstances, Your Honor, the people move for a dismissal of all charges against Ivy West. Case dismissed. Court is adjourned. Bailiff, will you please take this witness into custody? Oh, Mr. McKenzie, congratulations. Thank you. Uncle Bill, you were great. You're very important to me, Ivy. I was thinking about college. Yeah. Would I be crazy to change my mind and go back? No. You're supposed to change your mind. You're young. Young people get off track sometimes. Sometimes they find their way back. Sometimes they don't. Right this way, miss. It's the biggest story in town, and she won't be the one writing it. Yeah. Let's get out of here. Don't even think about it, son. We're all out of the woodwork wherever you go. You sure took care of him? No. Oh.